able to keep your doctor. What difference at this point does it make? If you're looking to make sense out of what's going on in the world today, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Southern Sense Talk Radio with your host, Annie, the Radio Chick Bellis, and featuring Curtis C.S. Bennett and the most interesting guests that you'll find anywhere on Internet Radio. And you can join the show and let your voice be heard by dialing 917 889 Three six seven five. So sit back, relax, and remember, Southern Sense is common sense. to another adventure here on Blog Talk Radio. You're here listening to Southern Sense on Blog Talk, SHR Media, the Lone Star Daily News up on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, YouTube, Facebook, all the heck with it. Just go to the name of the show, put a dash in the middle, southern-sense.com. I'm your hostess with the most, just the radio chick, Annie, along with my co-host, Curtis C.S. Bennett. Good afternoon, Curtis. How are you today? I'm doing just great. As you know, I'm, I'm back in Florida. Enjoying this nice warm weather, even though it's cooler at night, but I, I do welcome the cooler weather. All I need to add to that is for the clocks to go back in November, then I'll be set. <laughs> yeah, we hope, we hope. Uh, right now I'm having a little bit of an audio problem. I keep on getting a, a double sound back, so if I sound a little discombobulated during the show today, it's it's I don't know what's going wrong. <laughs> I'm hoping that it's broadcasting clearly. So if anyone is listening up in the chat room, just let me know whether or not you've got a good sound coming from both Curtis and I. Uh, it is, it's driving me crazy. Anyway, uh, we've got a lot to talk about, a lot to do. Um, we've got three great guests. We've got Peter DeBrasco. Uh, he's going to be joining us. He uh, has written a book on AOC about uh, left stream media, and he is now running for Congress out of North Carolina's 7th District. He'll be joining us at the start of the show. Uh, we're going to have Mary Ann Mendoza. She's with Angel Families and also We Build the Wall, Inc. Um, she has recently been banned on Twitter and Facebook. Yay! Uh, so much for you know caring about families being separated. She'll be joining us in the middle of the show, and we're going to end up uh, with the end of the show with your friend Ernie Ricard. So we've got a lot to talk about, a heck of a lot that's been going on out there. Uh, so let's get the show on the road, Curtis. All right, I'm ready. Yeah, I, I, just if someone can tell me in the chat room if you do have good sound, because I'm it's driving me crazy because I'm hearing double Curtis and everyone that's talking, I hear double back on myself. Just please someone in the chat room. Let me know if there is anything out there. Good. Anyway. Um, talk about discombobulating me. <laughs> anyway, those that listen to the show know that we start off each and every show with a dedication to a fallen hero. And today's dedication is going to go out to, um, Deputy Sheriff Justin Richard DeRosier out of Cowlitz County Sheriff's Office in Washington State. His end of watch was Sunday, April 14th of this year. And unfortunately, there was not a heck of a lot written about him. Uh, so I have very little to say, but we will try anyway. This is from The Reflector. And it reads... Cowlitz County Sheriff 
Office Deputy Justin R. DeRosier was shot in the line of duty near the 100 block of Follett Road off Calamea River Road on Saturday, April 13th. He later died from his injuries. Around 10, 11 p.m., DeRosier was dispatched after a call about a disabled vehicle blocking the roadway on Fallot Road. Shortly after he was shot, according to a news release, responding officers made efforts to save DeRosier on the scene before he was flighted to Peace Health Medical Center in Vancouver, where he died the following night. DeRosier was 29 years old and leaves behind his wife, and five-month-old daughter. In 2008, he graduated from Kelso High School and attended Washington State University for his degree in criminal justice. He was hired by the Cowlitz County Sheriff in 2016, and during his career, he served as patrol deputy, SWAT officer, and a boat operator. Today is a sad day for the Cowlitz County Sheriff's Office, said County Sheriff Brad Thurman, while fighting back tears during a press conference. It is the first time in 165 years in the Sheriff's Office existence that we lost a deputy in the line of duty. The Cowlitz County community mourned DeRosier's loss at a candlelight vigil at Lake Sacagawea in Longview. Law enforcement agencies locally and across the state have offered public condolences, and Sunday, Governor Jay Inslee tweeted, Our hearts go out to the family of the Cowlitz County deputy killed in the line of duty. Every one of these tragedies is a reminder that these men and women put their lives on the line every day in service to us all. The suspect shooter was killed the following night. According to the Daily News, the suspect was shot and killed around 7 a.m. on Spencer Creek Road after nearly a 22-hour manhunt and declared dead on the scene. Suspect was seen exiting the woods with a firearm on Spencer Creek Road. As of press deadline, the authorities have not released the identity of the officers involved or the suspect. Nearby, Calamea resident Trevor Broughton was home with his family when DeRosa was shot. We were all in the living room together with the doors locked, he said. It sounded like war. There was a gunshot, helicopters overhead, and cops on a loudspeaker saying, put your hands up. And this is from Last Call. Deputy Sheriff Justin Richard DeRosier, 29, was killed in the line of duty on April 14, 2019. Justin was born in Kilauea, Hawaii, on January 28, 1990, to parents Neil and Kelly DeRosier. Justin attended Kelso Public Schools and graduated from Kelso High in 2008. In 2012, Justin graduated from Washington State University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. His law enforcement career spanned eight years, beginning in 2011, first as a reserve deputy for the Whitman County Sheriff's Office, then as a police officer in Alaska for the Bristol Bay Borough Police. Justin became a full-time deputy sheriff for the Whitman County Sheriff's Office in 2013 and was sworn in as a deputy sheriff for the Cowlitz County Sheriff's Office in 2016. Justin's many hobbies and talents particularly enjoyed outdoor activities, adventures, classic cars, music, and spending time with his family and friends. Justin leaves behind the two loves of his life, his beloved wife of two and a half years, Catherine Ann Katie Smart, and their precious daughter, Lillian Naomi, who is six months old. They were his pride and joy. Justin is survived by his sister and best friend, Jenna DeRosier, parents Neil and Kelly DeRosier of Kelso, Washington, grandparents Richard and Darlene DeRosier of Kelso, Washington, Sharon O'Connell of Castle Rock, Washington, and numerous aunts, uncles, cousins, extended family, and friends, all of whom Justin considered family. Preceding Justin in death was his grandfather, Richard 
O'Connell. Today's show is dedicated to Deputy Sheriff Justin Richard DeRosier. It is also dedicated to all the brave men and women out there that serve as our first responders, be they law enforcement, firefighters, or emergency services. It is also dedicated to all the brave men and women that serve in our military from the birth of this great nation through today and into its magnificent future. We dedicate to them this song by Todd Allen Herndon, My Name is America. May God bless each and every one. I fought for my liberty I paid with the blood of my people Freedom has never been free Now my door's always open To dreamers and friends When I'm attacked I protect and I stand for my respect for humanity. Now I'm challenged by tyrants who envy my power, but their vicious deeds become my finest hour because my name is America. I stand for.
right, and we're back. You're here listening to Southern Sense here on Blog Talk Radio, SA Tron Media, Lone Star Daily News, up on iTunes, Stitcher, Speaker, YouTube, Facebook. Oh, the heck with it. Go to the name of the show, put a dash in the middle of southern com. Of course, I'm your hostess with the most, just the radio chick, Annie, along with my co host, the one, the only, the effervescent Curtis C.S. Bennett. Curtis, we have a lot to talk about, and uh, our first guest will be calling in at the half hour mark. So we've got a few minutes on our hands to talk about some stuff. You ready, yeah. willing, and able? Oh, yeah, and, and thinking of subjects to talk about, um, the left, they are forever giving us a lot. I mean, just look at the numerous attacks on this president. You know, if it's not one thing, it's another. You know, it never ceased to amaze me how they can come up with things to attack this president and, and the Republican Party. So, well, you know, yes, there's plenty to talk about. Well, it, it, it's it's never ending, and the attacks on Trump are just going on and on. You've got uh, Cyrus Vance Jr., the Attorney General in the state of New York, uh, demanding eight years of tax returns from Donald Trump. Uh, you've got California, Gavin Newsom signed into law, a mandate that anyone running for office of the presidency must file their tax returns uh, within the state. And yesterday, that one thing, that law in California, was knocked down by a federal judge. And not only is he going to be ruling to say this is unconstitutional, because in the Constitution, there is no requirement. The Constitution is pretty clear about what you have to do in order to run for president. And submitting your tax returns is not one of those cons- what those requirements. Because if you do it in one state, you have to do it in all 50 states. And that means it would require a constitutional amendment. So the judge knocked it down. And when he did it, he did it with a temporary restraining order, effective immediately to prevent irreparable harm. That is how serious this judge took this. Now, what's going on in New York is a whole nother story. That's in complete violation of the Fourth Amendment for a person to be secure in their persons and papers from unreasonable searches and seizures. Tell me what crime Donald Trump committed that would mandate him to surrender his tax returns for eight years. Has he been convicted of any crimes? Is he being charged with any crimes that demands this unreasonable search and seizure? No, but it doesn't matter to the left. (laughs) <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it's like they're in, in search for something that's wrong. You know, I mean, the whole impeachment process, or if you want to call it that, is not about any known or obvious crime this president has committed. They're in search of a crime, and that goes against our whole, you know, our principle, the, you know, the founders of this, this country, you know, you innocent to, to proven guilty. Instead, it's the opposite way around. They're considering him guilty until proven innocent. Hello, this is not France. France has that. We don't. We are specifically where, no, no, you're right. going to tell me what I did. You're going to tell me what charges I'm going to face, and you are going to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that I committed these crimes. That's not happening here. There is no crime. There is no cause to demand and subpoena his tax returns. <laughs> So I, I, I see this being tossed out the window, too. But they will continue to attempt to do this. They will continue. Yes, they will. And, you know, they're very creative, too, about what they do and how they go about doing this. You know, they can turn the table on a dime against you. I mean, think about it. We, we've gone after Hillary and... um Look how she slid out of that, you know, because most of the bureaucracy is crooked, you know, so they support these um, these lefties and whatnot, you know. Um, even though they may be, you know, Republicans in name only, their loyalty is not to the country or the people of the country. It is to the establishment and their own power and, and influence. So that's, that's what we have to work against. I mean, think about it, the Tea Party, you know, pretty much was, you know, attacked, you know, full force by um, people in the Obama administration. And um, we barely survived that. But, um, 
he put the IRS, you know, he weaponized certain bureaucracies against, you know, those on the right. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult battle, but I think we can win it with the president that we have in office now. Yeah, if we can keep them in office, because they're doing their damnedest. I don't know if you watched any of the Corey Lewandowski um, uh, testimony before the the House committee. I mean, oh, my God, that was more like rope-a-dope. He had them on the ropes nonstop. And I downloaded the video. It's like eight hours. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Oh, man, was that wonderful, Corey. Ah, and I loved having him on the show when we interviewed him when he uh, released his book. Uh, but I, I knew he was just going to play rope-a-dope with them. He, he does not put up with anything, anything. And Man, we're, we're getting ready to um, host um, Roger Stone. Now, that's the one that um, they, they raided his home early in the morning. You yeah, know, coming Roger's, after him. He Roger's been on the show a few times. He's been on the show a few times with us. Yeah, well, he's coming. He's coming to um, our our little area to speak. You know, and he said, um, had he known they wanted him, he, you know, all they had to do was make a phone call. He would have turned himself in. You know, but they had to um, go. You know, big with SWAT teams, and they call CNN and everything. You know, it's like you, you were, you know, on the hunt for. Um, Pueblo Escobar or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Guy said I would have just came, I would have took a taxi cab, you know, to the you know FBI you know headquarters. Yeah. But anyway, we'll we'll be hosting. Well, that's good. That, that is really really great. You know, because we had our but GOP. That, that's meeting. what the left does. You know. Yeah. <laughs> the, the left go way out to make us look bad. You know, like we're criminals. Well, you know, there's so much that's been going on. There was a um, Trump and Pence were out in California in the uh, Revolutionary Club. Not, no, they weren't at the Revolutionary Club, but they were out in California in the L.A. at a hotel. And a self-described communist group uh, did a counter protest burning the American flag outside the hotel. Revolutionary Club Los Angeles tweeted out a video proud of themselves burning the American flag and chanting, America was never great. Uh, and there's other things that they chanted that I can't say, I won't say over the air because it's just so foul. Um, America was never great, humanity first. Um, that's us who burned that rag because Trump, Pence are fasc fascists and Democrats are war criminals. So they're going after not just, you know, conservatives and republicans they're also going after democrats these people so you know i i don't understand the rise of communism here in the united states with so many freedoms with so many blessings here these this has to be a mental illness there's no other explanation for this it has to be a mental illness and this is a question you know we should have for not red flag laws for people owning guns should be red flag laws for people that have voters registrations on the left. You know, it, it, it's, it's insane. I, mean, I dare these people to spend five months living in Venezuela, go to North Korea, go to communist China and try living there and then tell me how good communism really is. Yeah, it, it just, it makes absolutely no sense to me. I, I don't think anyone can explain it. Well, there was a Black Panther named Eldridge Cleaver, and he fled to Cuba back in the 60s, late 60s, I believe. And from there, he went to live in um, Russia. And, you know, those were supposed to be his... Um, you know, um, dream paradise, you know, socialism. And after a point, he decided, you know, he had enough of that, and he turned himself in um, to, you know, authorities in the United States saying that uh, I'd rather be here in jail in a free country than to be free in a communist country. Oh, it goes so, through. you see, you got a lot of people talking about socialism and communism like, you know, it's the next best thing since um, um, Irish, you know, whiskey or something. And uh, 
they don't have a clue because they never lived that experience. You know, they ought to listen to people that come here from like Cuba and other places where they have dictatorships. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, I'm just picking out items that uh, I had uh, put together t- to fill in the time until our guest calls in. Uh, one of these things is up pops out of the former ESPN anchor, Jamil Hill. Uh, she is a huge black segregationist. Now, Curtis, you remember, and I remember, in the 60s, the civil rights movements, we fought to unite our country under one flag, one people, treating everyone on equal footing, no matter what your race, color, or creed is. And what this woman is doing is she's putting out an article to be published uh, in October. Uh, She's at the Atlantic right now. And what she is calling for is for blacks to leave white colleges. Her tweet was, very proud of my first magazine piece at the Atlantic, is appearing in October issue, been working on it for some time. Here it is. Why black athletes need to leave white colleges. Well, this is the very exact opposite of what we fought for. You know, you want you want to say, hey, listen, I want to be treated equally and fair, but yet now you want to segregate the races? Isn't that what we fought against? Yeah, we we fought to have integration, not segregation, and this person's mindset is, I, I have no doubt she was raised in a, I guess you would call it a black nationalist um, um, environment where, you know, they believe we should have a separate black state or even a, you know, a black country. I mean, that experiment um, went forth way back in the day when they created Liberia over in Africa. And I don't think that, that went too well. Matter of fact, one of their leaders um, just died recently, you know, and and he was ousted, you know, for being crooked and and, and wicked. So I don't know. They they just have this sense that they're somewhere out there, some kind of socialist utopia, and that capitalism and this republic, known as the United States, is evil and oppressive and. Um, they, they couldn't be more wrong, in my estimate. You know, she goes on to say, some black students feel safer, both physically and emotionally, on an HBCU campus. All the more so as racial tensions have risen in recent years. Yeah, because of individuals like this, like Jameel Hill, that racial tensions have, you are stirring the pot when there's nothing to stir there. Uh, navigating a predominantly white campus as a black student can feel isolating even for athletes. You know, why don't we call for our education system to churn out students better instead of just passing kids for the sake of passing them so you can get the federal tax dollars? Why don't you actually educate the kids so they are, are the quality that can attend college or technical school or go out into the workforce or do whatever it is they choose to do? Then she goes further to say, black athletes overall have never had as much power and influence as they do now, which is true. While NCAA rules prevent them from making money off their own labor at the college level, they are essential to the massive amount of revenue generated by college football and basketball. This gives them leverage. If only they could be moved to use it. So now here she's telling a talented athlete that, hey, listen, you're now at the NCAA level. You have all this talent and this power. So instead of welding the power for good, honing your skills, maybe getting out into professional sports or into whatever other area of Denver you want to get into, because now you're getting this education free because you're an NCAA player. You know they're out there on scholarships. They're not paying their tuition. There's no uh, college student loans for these players. So they are being recompensed for their playing ability. So instead of welding it into influence for the good, no, 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 boycott. Take the revenue away from the college. Let the college fail so the next athlete behind you that is just as good or even better than you will not have a chance. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I noticed 
the left, they are the one, the ones that are keeping racism alive in this country, um, just through um, the, the educational system, which teaches that um, um, the minority in America has been, you know, oppressed because of racism, and, and that this this country was founded by a bunch of, you know, white old slave owners and, and that's being drilled into these kids. And, um, you know, we're going to have to demand that the curriculum be changed to, um, to reflect the more truthful, um, if not the whole truth about this country's history and, and, and the two parties history, matter of fact, you know, because they're lying about the Republican party too, um, in our schools and they're making the, um, the Democrat Party sound like the party that's been there, you know, defending the rights of minorities for over 200 years as they lie on their uh, website. If you look up um, their website and look up the history of the Democrat Party, they say they've been out there defending the rights of minorities for over 200 years, and it's a bald-faced lie. So we, we have to get that kind of thing out there, you know. Absolutely. Well, well, let's bring our guest in. He's in on the line with us now, returning to us, um, author, columnist, and now congressional candidate out of North Carolina 7th District, Pete DeBrasca. Good afternoon, Pete. How are you today? I'm doing well, Annie. Thank you for having me back. Oh, it is our pleasure. we got to get people out there to drain the swamp. I mean, it's crazy, crazy, crazy out there. We were just discussing this article that's going to be coming up in the Atlantic by Jameel Hill, where she's calling for black athletes to leave white colleges to boycott. I mean, didn't we fight a whole civil rights war to unite and integrate the races rather than divide and segregate. This is some of the craziest stuff I'm seeing coming out of the left. At, at never before have I seen anything like this. Yeah, I mean, in, indeed we did fight uh, for such integration. And uh, the thing I was confused about most was Jamel's column. Uh, and I think, honestly, she should have uh, stuck with sports and stayed on maybe ESPN and, and moved away from politics. But I uh, guess not. Uh, I, I I don't, I'm not exactly sure what a quote unquote white college is, right? I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's not like any college in America. I don't know any college in America that is solely a white college. So I'm not exactly sure what she's talking about. Obviously we have historically black colleges and universities, uh, but they, you know, they're far outnumbered by you know, normal regular, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, integrated uh, universities all over the country. So like, what exactly is a white college? I'm not sure. Uh, and, and why you would try and you know, push us back some 70 plus years, I'm not exactly sure either. But, um, you know, that seems to be the case with the current social justice mood. Um, and they do this in, in all things, right? So they're, they're now allowing biological females to compete um, in high school uh, excuse me, biological males to compete in high school female sporting events like track and field, right, in the name of transgender rights. That's not promoting equality. You're letting boys compete in girls' sports, right? That's the opposite of equality. You're letting uh, biological males, you know, physically stronger just based on, uh, you know, being born male, uh, essentially dominate the playing fields against girls who have worked hard to be competitive athletes. That's not equality, right? Uh, so it seems like social justice has reached like the tipping point where now we're just going backwards. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sad to see, but, you know, we've got to try and rein these people in somehow. Absolutely. You know, I haven't grown up in the 60s. I, I remember the marches. I remember watching the riots on TV. And a whole generations of people fought to bring everyone together under one flag, one country. And, and then we have now a portion of our society that just wants to rend that completely apart. And all those people that suffered for those fights, how many were jailed, how many were beaten, how many were lynched, to bring us together, and all they want to do is just destroy all they fought for. And I, it, it breaks my heart. It really does. Uh, yeah, well, you know, part of it's a, fa a failure on behalf of the, the public school system, too. I mean, 
they just don't teach history well. You know, they don't they don't teach American kids about the history of the nation in which they're growing up, right, in which they live. Uh, so, you know, I mean, oh, there's another giant subject is our Confederate statues racist because, you know, people who fought for the Confederacy owned slaves. I think, you know, a lot of people on our side would say, well, no, that's just American history. You can't really judge uh, history by today's standards. That's sort of unscholarly. Uh, but the left does it anyways because, you know, they wanted to score political points out of it. So, um, you know, it's it's a product of now probably two generations of, of brainwashing in public schools, unfortunately. Well, you, you've nailed that directly on the head. And uh, we had our GOP meeting here in South Carolina, our local county one, and we had the school superintendent in and – what they're teaching the kids was brought up. Uh, the social justice warrior signs that are in the lobby and everything was brought up to the superintendent. And it's like, you know, what are you teaching these kids? You know, can we see? Can we go into the classroom? And when I talk about politics, I've said this many times, and my co-host Curtis will back me up, that all politics are local. If we don't get involved on the local level all the way on up, we're going to continue to lose generation after generation after generation to misinformed individuals who become our future voters. And this is what we got now. This is a nation being torn apart by people with a, a, a sick agenda. No, that's, you know, you're exactly right. And, um, and so to the point that all politics are local, this is something that I'm, I'm learning <clears throat> in my house race here in North Carolina seven. Um, so I went out, here's a story that will probably enrage you and your listeners. Uh, I know it definitely disappointed me. I went out to a, um, a, a GOP meeting in the county that I live in, which is in the district that I'm running in. Uh, this county has 227,000 people in it, and there were seven people who showed up at the GOP meeting. This was wow. two weeks ago when President Trump was in Fayetteville. The rally was you know, uh, the, the, the whole event was centered around his rally for Dan Bishop. Uh, it was a watch party, right? Uh, and out of the 227 people, thousand people that live in this County, we could only get seven people to show up to a meeting. I mean, this is why we're getting shellacked by the Democrats on the ground, right? <laughs> Cause we're not really engaged. Uh, I said this in an interview a couple of days ago. Uh, it's, it really is a big problem with us. We do not do local politics. The GOP does not do local politics. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Well, here we do. We do. We had uh, probably about over a hundred at our last meeting. Um, it was it was pretty packed. There wasn't very many empty chairs. And we do have candidates that come in, and we'll address the, our group too, as well as do different issues. And like I said, we had the school superintendent, and it was extremely informative. You know, we do get involved here, but that's that means that your county chair is not doing his or her job to invigorate the people to attend. You know, organizing precincts and getting out there, uh, endorsing legislations or introducing the voters to the candidates, doing these things. It's so, so, so important. And here you're running out of North Carolina District 7, and you're going to try to primary against uh, Representative David Roser. And as I was putting my notes, you wrote down, in your announcement, I had to crack up that I'm running for the Congress to retire chairman of the House Anonymous Caucus. <laughs> what the heck is an anonymous caucus? Or is that just your sense of humor? Yeah, so I mean, I, I've sort of coined the term anonymous caucus uh, to describe the part of the GOP that my uh, current congressman and the person I'm running against, the Rouser. Uh, represents, which is the group of, I don't know how many, it's probably about a hundred, maybe more GOP legislators that just go to Congress and you've never heard of them. And they don't really do anything, at least not publicly. Uh, they're certainly not, you know, making, causing a stir to try and help President Trump and further his agenda on things like border security. Um, and so they're just, you know, they're just these kind of quiet wallflower background guys. And so I've dubbed them the anonymous caucus. Uh, I think people would be shocked 
uh, about how many uh, Congress people they don't know. I mean, I, you know, I'm a reporter by trade. And so I spend a lot of time in Capitol Hill. And uh, when I'm walking around the Capitol, I, I can't count how many times I've, I've probably walked by legislators and I didn't even know they were elected officials, you know? Um, and so David Rouser, the guy I'm running against is one of these guys. And, and, uh, you know, particularly in his case, he's sort of being groomed for GOP leadership, right? Uh, which means that the more quiet he can be, the better, the, the less of a stir he causes, the better, uh, the less polarization for him, the better. Uh, and, and so we have this system that sort of, uh, incentivizes these people if they want to move up the chain to not cause trouble, right. To not make change, to not make waves that people might disagree with. And, and I think that is the exact wrong way to go about being a public official. Uh, if you're not bringing anything to the table in terms of helping ordinary Americans and, and supporting legislation that, you know, they want enacted, then you're not really doing your job, are you? And just seems to me that most of Congress has behaved this way since President Trump has, has been elected. Um, and I'm very disappointed by that. I think, uh, I mean, we had the House and the Senate and the presidency uh, from 2017 to early this year. And uh, we didn't we didn't really do anything with it. You know, we got some tax cuts. That was good. Uh, but we didn't. I mean, I, you know, President Trump should have been chained to his desk signing legislation, uh, uh, fixing the, the immigration crisis that we have in this country. And instead, we just kind of blew it. Uh, and that's what the GOP does, unfortunately. Um, and it's kind of sort of historically the story with them. Well, you know, I, I was reading your platform, and people can find out more about you by going to your campaign website, which is Pete4NC.com. Uh, there's a link up on the show page, so when people listen to the archives, they can also click on it and uh, see what you're all about. But you, you signed a term limit pledge. Uh, and... We have also a seat coming up here in my district uh, that Beer Can Cunningham Joe is currently holding. Um, mm-hmm. The problem with term limits is that if you go only, say, for like two or three terms, what happens with these committees now? Because it takes you so long to work yourself up into the a position to be able to be on or chair a committee that by the time you work it up, your term limited out. So what happens then? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's a good question. The committee structure would have to be reorganized, I'm sure. Um, but I think that there's a greater good in term limits than there, than there is, honestly, in having committees. The committees, to me, uh, you know, when I, whenever I watch somebody testify before a congressional committee, it always kind of strikes me as a dog and pony show, particularly if somebody powerful is testifying like uh, you know, like a Mark Zuckerberg said, uh, you know these people have more money than God. Uh, they know that they can they can behave with impunity. Uh, a day a day in front of Congress under oath is nothing to them, right? So, I think that they, in the interest of the greater good, and in the interest of not having career politicians who are beholden to lobbyists and uh, Wall Street and big business and so forth, I think it's important that we promote grassroots candidates, uh, people who have their hand on the pulse of, of, you know, the ordinary Americans that live within their districts instead of, uh, you know, the lobbyists a couple blocks down the road from Pennsylvania Avenue, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that would be my case uh, for term limits. I think that you could pretty easily restructure the, the committee situation. And who knows? I mean, maybe, maybe having the committees reshuffled every four or six years uh, it makes them more effective at, at doing what they, you know, uh, what they do now, which is you know, generally oversight in different areas. Well, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I was going to say that there is some truth to that because if you know that your term limited, then you're on this committee and you want to take that political power that you have with you to the next level, whether you're going from the House to the Senate, you're going to be a little bit more motivated to get the job done, wouldn't you be? Yes, that's right. Um, And, you know, that's the general idea behind term limits as a whole. It's like I have a finite amount of time uh, to go and, and, you know, make my mark and, and help my constituents uh, I'm going to go do it instead of, you know, waiting around for 30 or 40 years uh, and then, you know, maybe helping them when I'm on my way out the door after I've sort of enriched myself, 
from the powers that be. This was, you know, this is a very, I'm running a very populist campaign here. Um, and frankly, I'm not a huge fan of the GOP as like an institution. Uh, I would consider myself a conservative, um, but more of a populist. I'm sort of like a Tucker Carlson conservative in that I care about ordinary Americans and the struggles that they face and like securing their prosperity for the next generation and the generation after that. And it just seems to me that we don't have our eye on that ball in Washington, D.C. Uh, and rather we, we sort of have an eye on, um, on how we can work with big business to advance our own interests. You know, it's it's funny because I was reading some of the uh, pieces that were put up on the internet about you know you and Laura Loomer and a couple other people running, and they have you as media talking heads out there to expand your fan base. That you're not <laughs> serious about running. Uh, I think you're pretty serious, aren't you? Yeah. So that was an interesting piece that the Daily Beast did, wherein uh, Will Sommer, who is one of my least favorite journalists in history, uh, and I use the term journalist loosely in this context, uh, that was a piece wherein he disproved his own theory uh, by like three of the four examples that he gave. So I think he said uh, something like, there were four candidates he talked about. There was Deanna Lorraine, who's running against Nancy Pelosi in in that district out there where that she's probably going to win, you know, 75 to 25%, right? So that's an uphill battle. And, you know, maybe Deanna is in it for fame. I don't know. But it's still no reason to not run, right? Like, we shouldn't be discouraging people who run for office just because you know, they live in a district where Democrats dominate. So I think that's a bad argument to begin with. But but then I mean, he lists other candidates, right? He lists Joey Saladino, who lives in a swing district in in New York, meaning that if he wins the Republican primary, he has a, a good chance to go to Congress so, he, you know, he's not in it just to bolster his profile. The guy's already got a huge profile anyways. I mean, talk about Laura Loomer. She's in a, 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 a heavily Democratic district, but she's Laura Loomer. You know, I mean, she's got, she's already got clout and, and power that could very well flip that district. Uh, and then, you know, they, they talk about me at the end of the article. <laughs> I'm running in a GOP primary. I mean, there's nothing in this for me. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just to make enemies with the party that I'm a part of. Um, and try and fight on behalf of, of the ordinary people. Uh, see, there was a, yeah, it's an interesting article. I, I just, you know, uh, you know, MAGA talking heads or whatever. But uh, hey, all press is good press, so I'll take it. You know, keep the hippies <laughs> smiling. Uh, it's good momentum for me. Well, on your platform, you mentioned about I put down in my notes as national security, but you concentrated on the border. And uh, I have a friend of mine, Mike Cutler, who was a INS agent. He's testified before the 9-11 Commission. Uh, he's testified before Congress numerous times. Uh, he was also responsible for deporting several times an illegal alien who went further to kill a fellow friend and a fellow police officer in New York, uh, Bob Machadi. I've known Michael for 30 years, but and he he hammers this home. When we deal with border security, we can't look at just the southern border, the northern border. All 50 states are border states because we have international ports of entry through airports, rivers, uh, the sea. So we have to look at border security through all 50. And you do address that. And I found that when I was going through all everything about you in your notes about the H-1B-1 and H-1B-2 visas. Those people that are overstaying, those people that are taking American jobs, which is actually against the federal law. Uh, you address that issue also, because you got to remember the 9-11 hijackers all came in on visas. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So so visas are a huge issue for me. So, so and just to be clear, I think I'm running on the most restrictive immigration platform, maybe of any Republican in, in modern history. I would essentially like to return us to the 1924 Immigration Act, which barred everybody from coming here for the most part, right? Um, I want to put an enti- a total moratorium on immigration, legal and illegal, for a period of a decade uh, while we figure out how to build a merit-based system of immigration that works for the American people. Um, and putting such a moratorium in place would actually in itself drive a merit-based system because by making uh, you know, no entry the rule, we would then be making exceptions to the rule when we do let people in. 
uh, and those exceptions would obviously be based on merit, right? So I'm getting married and, and my relative is an American citizen or, you know, this, this hospital needs this brilliant neurosurgeon from, you know, whichever country. And so we're going to bring him in or her in, right? Um, so that, that's sort of my, my flagship idea. But, the, you know, visa overstays are a huge problem. Um, and, you know, the, the visas that give away jobs in the first place are a huge problems. So like 70 plus percent of the tech industry uh, is here working on a visa. And uh, they're foreign workers. Seventy plus percent of them are foreign workers. And uh, they're basically coming here as indentured servants to the companies that hire them. So if you come here as a foreign worker on an H1, I think it's an H1B, I still haven't gotten all the letters right yet, but if you come here on a foreign visa to work at a company like Twitter, uh, you are bound to work at Twitter. If you do not work at Twitter, they send you home and you have to reapply to work at another company. So these people essentially become indentured servants. That's not a good uh, idea. And, you know, we should be hiring Americans for these jobs at American companies anyways, uh, and then, you know, the, the the temporary ag visas are a joke because everybody just stays, right? There's no system by which we can account for these people after their visas have expired. So you have like 600,000 of those every year, and most of them just stay, right? I mean, over half of the illegal immigrants in America did not cross the border illegally. They just overstayed a visa. Uh, so deportation of illegal aliens is going to be a big part of this as well. Um, and people call it crass and, and they call it, you know, racist and they call it all kinds of different names, but I don't know another country on earth uh, that doesn't have its borders, at least somewhat secure or some kind of immigration policy to decide who can and cannot go there. Um, and it's, you know, well past time for America to implement an immigration policy of its own because the one we have right now basically says, if you live within walking distance, or you pick vegetables for a living, you can come here, right? So um, I think we can do a little bit better than that. You know, you had to... Peter. Oh, go, go ahead, Curtis. Yeah, okay. Let's say you, you're in Congress now. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, Antifa and how they should be labeled and dealt with? Yeah, I am. Uh, I am not a big fan of Antifa. I've had firsthand experience with those clowns. Um, I do think they should be labeled as a domestic terror organization. Um, I don't think there's any reason why you should have a group of, of black mask wearing thugs out in the street beating people, journalists, others, uh, without you know labeling them as either a domestic terror organization or a gang, right? A violent gang. And uh, actually, I think that the, the, the gang designation would be better uh, because it would allow local police, local gang task forces to go out to those rallies and arrest mobs of Antifas for being out there when they get violent, right? Um, or for, you know, it, doing the, the more sort of petty illegal things that they do, like, you know, carrying knives in, in public places and so on and so forth. Um but, yeah, I'm not a big fan of Antifa and, and certainly would work uh, to get them off of the streets and and keep them off of our uh, university sort of common grounds where they tear down statues and, uh, and beat up journalists like they've done to me and so forth. So, uh, yeah, not a big Antifa fan at all. <laughs> I would take that. I'd occupy Wall Street, BDS, all throw them all into the same pot. Yeah. Um, but I want to go back on to yeah. the immigration because I had a couple more questions for you on that one. Because you had mentioned about the deportation of illegals. And considering we have an unknown number, no one can say for sure how many we have here. How would you start the process? Because I think there are certain things you can do that would cause people to self-deport themselves before we have to actually go out and, and take people off the street or whatever you want to call it uh, to actively deport people here illegally. And we also have sanctuary cities such as down in Maryland where we have an, a an horrible, horrible increase in crime, especially rape of young children. Um, how would you start the process? Yep. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a good question. Sanctuary cities are the place to start, first of all. I am enraged at our elected officials 
that that they would continue to let child rape at the hands of illegal aliens go on. I mean, like, how many more children need to be raped before we get serious about illegal immigration? Like, how many more times does the American flag have to be taken down in an ICE facility uh, and have a Mexican flag raised over it before we realize that, you know, we're being invaded, that, that all of the actions by illegal aliens and by people who do not support ICE and Customs and Border Patrol are the actions of invaders. They do exactly what invaders would do when they invade a nation. They fly their own flag. They rape your children. You know, they cost you tons of money, so they plunder you, right? That's what they do. And that's what we've got going on right now. Nobody seems to recognize this, and if they do, they're just ignoring it. Um, But to answer your question, I mean, it starts, it definitely starts at the county level, right? And we have this problem, you know, Mecklenburg County, which is home to Charlotte here, is a sanctuary county. And so uh, the, the local police do not honor um, ICE detainer requests. So when an illegal immigrant commits a crime and ICE places a detainer on them, uh, if they get bail, they get to walk. They don't go to the custody of ICE, right? Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's the prime place where you start deporting people, right? It's people who commit crimes, uh, they're already, who are already being arrested, right? So, you know, you're an illegal alien. You've already committed the crime of being an illegal alien. You should not be here in the first place. And then you commit another crime on top of that. Once you get arrested for committing that crime, there shouldn't even be an adjudication process. You should get kicked out for the original crime of coming here illegally, right? Uh, so, so that's a prime place to start by deporting people who are arrested for crimes after crossing the border illegally. Um, on a higher level, I think, you know, once a lot of those folks are deported and once um, illegal aliens see that Americans are, are getting serious about border security, I think you're right that a lot of people will self-deport. Um, you know, but it's got to come down to whenever we identify that somebody is here illegally over state of visa or um, – or across the border illegally, they have to be arrested and they have to be sent back. Uh, and, you know, it, once we start doing that, and by the way, I think really the first move is to build a wall. Um, I think that, you know, the analogy is sort of, what do you do when your bathtub is overflowing? The first thing you do is stop the water, right? So I think the first move before we start deporting people is to build a wall so that more people can't keep coming in. Uh, but then you start at the local level, and, and every time an illegal alien is identified, we have to have a process where we can deport them without, you know, anybody getting in the way. Uh, the, the, the courts, the immigration courts are, are a big force in blocking Trump's sort of closed borders agenda. Um, and, you know, it, none of it makes any sense to the ordinary person, and I would consider myself to be like an ordinary person. So um, I think that I think that, you know, bottom line, we have to put a sane process in place to essentially restore our national sovereignty. Exactly, exactly. And you also address birthright uh, citizenship as well as chain migration. And you had mentioned bringing back the laws to the 1924 uh, uh, level. Um, I do remember... uh, it was changed in 1972. Prior to that, you had to go into a um, application. You have to. This is what my my husband's family had to do. They had to go into a displaced persons camp after World War II. And they had to wait two years before they had the sponsorship, a job, and a house waiting for them before they could even fly over the Atlantic Ocean. And they had to go through extensive interviews and background checks. We're not doing any of that anymore. So consequently, we have this one guy that was arrested as a member of Hezbollah. And he's been a member of Hezbollah since 1996. He had uh, pictures on his phone and, and computer of all over the East Coast from the Brooklyn Bridge on to D.C. and further, uh, places to attack. He was a known bomber for Hezbollah. If we're not doing background checks, who are we letting into our country? Yeah, I mean, we're we're letting in the the worst of of what the world has to offer, right? No sane country on earth does what we do. Uh, Try to go to Poland without the right paperwork and see what happens. You know, they will kick you out. They will turn you around at the border and say, thanks for coming. 
go home, right? We don't do any of that. Um, in terms of chain migration and birthright citizenship, I mean, those are both a joke if you think about it. So chain migration is this. Chain migration is not just, I am a United States, I have become a United States citizen now, and I would like for my spouse to be able to come here too. To me, that's fine, right? You can bring your spouse. I'm not like a, I'm not that hard line of an immigration guy, right? But what we've got is not just husbands and wives and their kids, right? Not just a nuclear family unit. We've got second cousins twice removed coming here based on the fact that their second cousin twice removed became an American citizen, right? So consequently, we're importing entire third world villages, some of whom are illiterate in their own language, never mind English, right? Um, and, and I mean, and that's what we're dealing with when it comes to chain migration. So that's where you start to, by the way, that's where you start to get the, the self-deportations, right? If you, if you deport, you know, half the family, the other half will probably go home to be with the family. That's why they came here in the first place was to be with the family, right? So, um, yeah, chain migration, not a good idea. Birthright citizenship, a terrible idea. Uh, is something that is, is not protected by the Constitution, contrary to popular belief. Uh, a lot of people say the 14th Amendment protects that. I don't believe to that, that to be the case. There's a lot of sort of legal scholarship about that. Um, but, you know, you, shouldn't, you really shouldn't be able to become a citizen by virtue of being born on, on, on U.S. soil. That, that's an incentive for illegal aliens. That's why, um, you know, many pregnant women cross the southern border illegally. Uh, so that their children can be born here and become citizens automatically. And by the way, those births often happen on, on the public dole, right? If you come here with nothing and you have a child, somebody's got to pay for the, the health care involved in having a child, and it's thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, and it's, it's always on, on a taxpayer dime, right? So, I mean, like all of these policies, in effect, are bad for Americans. And so it's time to f- turn our attention to what's actually good for Americans for once, this is why Trump got elected. Uh, it was because it wasn't because you know he speaks particularly well or he had experience in politics or he was you know particularly polished. It was because he was the first candidate in decades that people looked at and said, "Hey, like this guy seems to care about me. You know, seems to want to fix the things that matter to me." Um, and you know that's why he blew through the GOP primary with 17 candidates and subsequently won the election. So, um, you know, I think it would be wise of the GOP to get on board this train of actually caring about the American people and listening to them and trying to trying to solve their problems, the issues that they care about, instead of, you know, focusing their time on, uh, on, on you know, cutting taxes for corporations and so forth and big business and lobbying, Wall Street and all that. Yeah, there was one thing you mentioned slightly in one of the uh, notes I have here that you were going to be working on legislation for tax remittance, and I'm, I'm curious as what you meant by tax remittance. Yeah, so when you tax, so so there's a huge amount of money. It's like in in uh, so I think it's upwards of thirty billion dollars a year uh, that is sent back to Mexico alone, not just, you know, not all illegal aliens, but just to Mexico alone uh, by people who have crossed the border here illegally. So when people cross the border here illegally and they send money back to Mexico to help their families or for, you know, for whatever reason, uh, that's a remittance. And so you could actually tax those remittances when an illegal alien sends a sum of money back to Mexico um, and we could put that in our back pocket, help pay for the wall, or um, you know, do any any number of things to help the American people. So that's that's part of the platform too. That's that's one uh, policy item a lot of people have been calling for. I, I I thought that's what you were talking about, but I wasn't sure. But I found it curious that Mexico is not the number one for remittances being sent for, by uh, aliens over here. Actually, it's India, believe it or not. And I found that very interesting that yeah. India outdoes Mexico. Uh, interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, I want to shift a little bit here because we've now got a major attack on our Second Amendment rights. Um, Trump is talking about expanding background checks. I don't know how far that's going to go. They're calling for red flag laws. And, oh, Lord, that 
that drives me absolutely crazy. It's gotten so bad that just yesterday, Colt announced that they were going to the end the production of AR-15 rifles for personal use, as if it's the rifle itself that has caused the mass shootings, not the individual holding the weapon. Yeah, the the idea that uh, that further gun control is going to stop bad people from getting guns is obviously absurd. Um, it's one of these things that's been proven time and time and time again. You never really hear that story in the mainstream media, do you? Like days after the mass shooting, when they find out that the weapon that was used in the mass shooting was obtained illegally, right? Uh, which seems to always generally be the case. And I follow up on these things because I do the news for a living, but ordinary people don't, so they would never know. Uh, and so consequently they think that, Taking away the rights of law-abiding citizens is the answer, and it's just not. I mean, it's, it is, it, if you think that 300-plus million guns are coming out of the hands of American citizens, you are in bizarro world, my friend. Um, and there are actually liberals who are calling for that. I mean, Beto O'Rourke is now calling for the confiscation of weapons, of they are 15 And so the question, I think, becomes how many people are, is the government willing to kill in order to take their weapons, right? Because that's what's going to happen when the gun confiscation task force shows up at your house. You're going to get a lot of people who are going to say, no, thanks, I don't think I'm going to give you my guns to you. Uh, And, you know, violence is only going to happen there. So the answer for me, I'm willing to let the government kill zero people to take away guns. And anybody who answers more than zero is wrong. (laughs) I mean, uh, it's a ridiculous proposition. Red flag laws are also absurd. And I, for the life of me, and honestly, you know, I was considering running for Congress, but this is what pushed me over the edge. I live in North Carolina. You live in South Carolina, right? Uh, so, you know, we're pretty pro-gun around here. This is the southern United States. Um, but nobody in our federal congressional delegation in North Carolina, except for Mark Meadows, would stand, would, has stood up against red flag laws, proposed red flag legislation. In fact, our esteemed Senator Tom Tillis actually supports red flag legislation. He came out in favor of it, um, which led to a funny moment at that Fayetteville rally for Dan Bishop two weeks ago uh, when Donald Trump Jr. introduced Tom Tillis to come talk to the crowd. He got booed almost off the stage, which was hilarious. Uh, Yeah, red flag laws are are a travesty. So the effect of red flag laws is going to be that they will be used as political tools. So, you know, let's say I'm a law-abiding gun owner and my neighbors are radical leftists and they don't like the fact very much that I'm a conservative gun owner. Don't you think they would just red flag me, right? Um, It's also going to hurt our veterans uh, disproportionately, right? They come home from war with PTSD and, you know, they have mental health issues. And so, Somebody's going to say, well, you know, I don't feel comfortable with this guy having a gun, and they're going to red flag that person. And that person has literally gone to war to fight for this nation and come home to have his rights stripped from him. Uh, These are absurd policies, and nobody seems to be defending, uh, you know, the rights of ordinary citizens. I, I, I watch it in astonishment. Yeah, I'm looking for an article as you're talking because I pulled this up and I had it with a different guest. Um, There is a movement in Congress to take away the uh, nonprofit status of various organizations. Uh, One of them was the the Security Council policy. Um, Trying to, oh, here it is. Here we are. Here we go. Uh, In order to silence them, especially if they happen to be someone that happened to be pro-life or pro-Second Amendment, if it doesn't agree with the left in Congress, they want to pull away their tax-exempt status. And here we go. Uh, The Federation for American Immigration Reform, FAIR. Um, The Center for Security Policy. The Family Research Council. They want to label them as hate groups as designated by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which in itself has been labeled a hate group. And this is what our Congress is doing to us. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. And, and eventually it's going to get to the point where anybody who has right of center views is going to be labeled a hater, right? Um, in fact, the, the Family Research Council, 
uh, was the subject of a domestic terrorist attack because of its designation by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group. So uh, in 2012, and, and so one of the things I've done is I've done a ton of, of reporting on SPLC. Well, you just faded out there, Peter. From that organization. Okay. Peter, you faded out. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you now. Can you hear me now? Yep, got you now. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that one of the things I've done as as a reporter, I've done a ton of investigative work on the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, and I can tell you that there are uh, things in, in the making that are going to make life difficult for the Southern Poverty Law Center in the near future. Um, but uh, so they they put the Family Research Council on their list of hate groups. And subsequently, in 2012, uh, an armed gunman entered the Family Re- Research Council's headquarters in Washington, D.C., with the intent of killing everybody inside and smearing them with Chick-fil-A sandwiches because the group is considered to be anti-LGBT. Uh, thankfully, they had a quick security guard on duty who shot the perpetrator. Uh, the perpetrator lived, and he went on, and he actually testified that the reason he chose the Family Research Council was because it was on the Southern Poverty uh, Law Center's hate group list. So, I mean, this is, I mean, we, we literally have uh, nonprofit organizations inspiring domestic terrorism against other nonprofit organizations uh, that, you know, hold the opposite political opinions of theirs. And uh, you know, it doesn't really make for um, a political, di- a, a, a healthy political discourse in America when we're shooting each other instead of maybe talking. Um, but that's, I mean, that's the reality of what we've got going on now. Well, you know, when we, we look at the rise of these, quote, mass shootings, you know, they're, they're worried about these gunmen that they're doing these things, but they're not looking at why it's happening. You know, instead of doing the red flag laws, look at what's causing this mental illness, because this is exactly what it is. For you to want to go out and to murder someone, there is a mental illness there. You know, that should not be the way in which you solve a problem. So if you're the subject of a bullying, find yes. out why. Uh, if if you are become so desensitized that you no longer see the humanity in the person standing next to you that you want to shoot them, Find out why. What is causing this in our society? Why is it happening here and now? And why didn't it happen like 50 years ago? That's right. And uh, so this is something I've done a lot of thinking about, actually. Um, and it's hard to say for certain, right? So, so my answer would be speculative. But I would have to guess that it has something to do with the breakdown of the American society. So 40% of American children are born uh, out of wedlock now, meaning that most of the time they don't have fathers, um, you know, unless there's no sort of authoritative figure in the household or, or somebody there to teach them right and wrong. Um, people who are born out of wedlock are, are vastly overrepresented in the prison population. They're vastly less likely to graduate from high school and get a college degree. They're far more likely to commit crimes. There's all kinds of negative externalities uh, that come along with people being born out of wedlock. Uh, which is happening more and more frequently. So that's, you know, that's a big issue that we have to face. The other issue, I think, is that there's a lot of hopelessness and despair out there, to be honest with you. And so, you know, when I look at uh, a, lot of my, a lot of my peers, a lot of people who are close to my age, and I'm only 27, so, you know, I'm at the very tail end of the millennial generation. And I look around at, at, at people who I graduated with co- from college with who have a, de- a degree from a private university, uh, who are are barely surviving? You know, they're barely making enough money to to pay their rent and to pay off their student loans. And so, um, you know, after five or eight years of that, there's a there's a, a level of despair that sets in where it's you know this vicious sort of wage slavery cycle that is not good for our society. And you know, it leads to further negative externalities like uh, putting off critical life steps that people used to take automatically, like getting married, buying a home, and having children, right? And, and particularly the having children part uh, is the negative externality because and we already have birth rates in America that are lower than replacement level. Uh, so there's, you know, it's, it's, it speaks to, I think, what's going on at a macro level in our society as a whole. Um, 
But, you know, we had the Tommy gun in, in the 1920s and 30s, right? I, I, fully automatic machine guns available for purchase. But any kind of fancy background check, and there was never a mass shooting. Yeah, are you, um, are you, you walking know, around because you're fading in and out? I am not. Let's see. <laughs> How's this? All right. Sounds great. Can you hear me now? It sounds great. We got a comments in the chat room as you're talking. They want, they're asking about you, and, and you're only 27 years old, and you're running for Congress. You feel you have this responsibility to you know, bring America back to where she should be. And you mentioned you know, that we had the Tommy gun in the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s, and, yeah, and we didn't see massive shooting unless you include Bonnie and Clyde. Um, or the Barker brothers, uh, but it, it, it's, there is a breakdown in society, and I've mentioned this many times on the show, because now people are so buried in their smart devices. You go to a restaurant, you no longer see people having a conversation with each other as they dine together. You see everyone yep. with their smart device, and there's no conversation. Uh, and if there is conversation, it's only one side. You will hear what I have to say and accept it instead of, you know, knowing how to have a civil discourse, it, this is not being taught in the home. And, you know, it used to have social grace class, you know, in in school, we had it, you know, how you introduce yourself, how you shake hands, how you, yeah. how you speak to each other. We can't even do that. I had uh, one of our visiting pastors sit down in my living room because I'm handling these kids. These kids are getting ready to go out into college in the job market. They cannot even look me in the eye and introduce themselves to me. There is a complete, total breakdown in social character and social norms. The breakdown in the family, the breakdown of the church, the breakdown of the neighborhood. How many people know the person that lives next door to them? Have they ever walked up and That's introduced right. themselves? No, you're, you're, you are 100% correct, right? And so, um, and one of the reasons why I'm so dead set on the, on the immigration track is because of what you just described. It's, it's communities and societies uh, that, that do not exist cohesively anymore. What happens when you go outside your door and you don't speak the same language as your next door neighbor? That's happening in, not just in urban areas in America. But in suburbs all across the country, it's terrible for social cohesion. We don't have communities anymore. Right? So when you don't recognize your neighbor, when, when you have nothing in common with your neighbor, why would you try to, you know, be, uh, to live in a civil society? I mean, why would you do things to better your community if there is no feeling of community at all? You wouldn't, right? Um, and and this, is one, this is one of the consequences, honestly, of mass immigration. I'm not saying that's related to the mass shooting deal, um, but it certainly is related to the breakdown of, of American society. And uh, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed if we're going to continue to survive as a nation. I mean, these, that's, how, that's how imperative it is that we deal with immigration, like ASAP. Absolutely. Now, what there, I believe... Go ahead, Curtis. What I wanted to add was that uh, when it comes to the breakdown of morality and the um, the lessening of appreciation for life in America, I actually think a lot of this is orchestrated. You know, it's been a socialist dream to uh, reinvent America, and and it would not reflect anything that we are used to or or what the founding fathers intended, you know, as far as our freedoms and liberties. Um, I mean, we, back in the 50s and 60s, and I would say even the early 70s, we used to have gun clubs in, in high school. I, I used to ride the, the, the trolley and the bus with kids that had their rifles, you know, in the case and whatnot, and nobody shot nobody. You know, you had gangs back then. But gang members fought other gang members, and basically it was just fist fighting, and maybe somebody might get stabbed. Um, maybe. <laughs> and even when they were shooting, they didn't include, you know, innocent people. That, that right. They were never the target. But with drugs today, um, it doesn't matter, you know, whether you, you're in the game or out the game or innocent bystander. If you get in their way, they'll shoot you. Um, we don't have... Um, people who respect life because, I mean, look at abortion, you know, they dehumanize um, life 
and people yes. constantly get abortion. So, you know, this society, this, this generation, I would say, that's coming up, they are so depressed and everything because look at the messaging that they receive, um, especially in the urban areas. It's all doom and gloom. And like I said, I think it's purpose, you know, for that 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 is being done this way so those on the left can have an excuse to change society, you know, to what they believe it should be. What are your thoughts on no, that? The- well, it's, you're certainly right about that. Like this is this is engineered. The movement that that we that we are seeing is engineered. And so there's a there's a great book. I, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you guys have read Breitbart, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Andrew Breitbart, before he tragically died, wrote a book called Righteous Indignation, and it it describes one of my favorite books. It describes uh, exactly where this sort of collectivist far leftist movement began, which was uh, in the Frankfurt School. Um, after World War II, so it's basically a bunch of academics trying to figure out how they could implement communism in America. And they realized that, you know, communism as an economic uh, solution would be a hard sell for America, given its you know, capitalist history. And so what they decided to do instead was divide and conquer along racial and sexual orientation and gender and uh, social lines, right? So um, they said, it's, it's, and that's, you know, that's where the term, you guys probably heard this term, cultural Marxism comes from, right? So they said, um, if we can tear people apart, then we can also provide them with the solution to being torn apart, and that solution is collectivism. So um, it's, I mean, it's absolutely, it's, I wish I had, you know, re- if I had done that question was coming, I would have refreshed myself on the book, um, but uh, it's definitely engineered. I mean, there's no doubt about it. The far left loves this chaos. Um, I mean, you look at it, look at it. It's, it's effective. You know, it's 30% of, of young people prefer socialism to capitalism right now. Um, so it's <laughs> they're they're executing their plan, and we are not executing ours, to be honest. And it's so true. And Curtis was right on point that the dehumanization of our society is is a major cause of concern. So instead of having red flag laws, let's look at how we can, you know, reform our society to bring it back to a, a family and a community where we interact with with each other. And it's funny because we're talking about, you know, helping your neighbor or whatever. One of the people in the chat room came in saying, sorry, he was late because he was helping a neighbor search for a missing cat. But that's what neighbors should be doing. And, <laughs> but we're not. Yes. <laughs> See, the, 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 we do have humanity no. out there. We just have to know how to reach out to it. No, that's right. I, I, look, I was super blessed to grow up the way I grew up in a blue collar household with two parents who uh, were disciplinarians and who believed in community. And, you know, largely the community I grew up in was the same way. It was middle class. We all played sports together. We all did things together on the weekends. We took care of each other. If somebody had a problem, you figure out how to fix it. Um, and I just don't see that happening in a lot of places. And, and I mean, I live in a condo complex now, a townhome complex. And frankly, I only know, <laughs> I only know one neighbor. You know, and it's kind of disappointing. Um, so we need to, we do, we need to return to the very sort of basic societal instincts and and. To, to pry in our communities. Uh, we used to do things when I was growing up, like uh, get together and, and pick up trash together, you know, on the side of the road, because we had a sense of pride. Like, this is our town. We want to keep it clean, you know? I, I, I wonder if people even do that anymore. I don't think they do. No, how many and times do you uh, see kids playing in the yard? <laughs> you don't about that. You don't even see kids playing in the yard anymore. Right. But uh, I'm seeing that we're running down on the clock. There was a question in the chat room a little bit earlier. Uh, Holger wanted to know who you felt was the best president uh, of the United States. Because you are a real strong pro-Trump supporter. And I know that you, you favor him, but would you, would you put someone else above him? Oh, man, it's, it's such a hard question i mean it's nearly impossible to answer uh, i'm a i'm a big uh thomas jefferson fan personally um i i don't think you can when you ask that question i don't think you can stray away from any of the founders you know i mean george washington was 
the best president in, in the United States. I mean, he essentially founded the country, right? He brought this country into existence. Those people uh, created this the, the system of governance uh, that has been the best in world history. I mean, how do you beat that? And Trump's great and all, and he's fun, right? But he's not George Washington, you know? Uh, so I don't know. That's a tough question, but uh, I would have to go with the, the founding fathers collectively, um, as as the people I look up to for for sort of governmental advice. You know, I mean, what was this nation meant to be, and what is it meant to be going forward? Well, you know, the solution lies in our early history. So I think that uh, it's the best answer I can give to that question. All right. Now, I just want to make a little mention. There's a new book that's coming out because you wrote a book on AOC as well as the other one that you had just released in July, Enemies, the Press versus the American People, where you really hammer (laughs) your fellow mediaites out there. Um, The ABCs of AOC. And oh, man, I I can just start hearing you cracking the jokes on the ABCs of AOCs. And um, I'm... I'm trying to read this as I'm, I'm talking to you. It's from advocate to feminist, grassroots to queens, and revolutionary to zeal. The ABCs of AOC introduces readers to values, places, and issues that relate to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's life and platform. A clear and engaging explanation of each term is paired with a stunning contemporary illustration that will delight readers. This is an alphabet book like no other. Peter, what are you going to do when you get to Congress and you look this woman in the face? <laughs> that sounds like communist propaganda to me. To be very honest. Uh, but um, look, you know, AOC, for all of her faults, is a populist. I do believe that she is more genuine in what she believes than most of the other members of Congress, because she was a grassroots candidate. She was not bought and paid for. She basically had no shot to win her primary and she won it anyways. Uh, So for all of her faults and all of her bad ideas and all the dumb things she says and her total lack of experience, at least I get the sense when I look at AOC that she's being her genuine self and not trying to prop herself up for, you know, donors or some kind of, um, you know, there's a bigger interest beyond that of the American people. She's great as a populist. She's just got the wrong populist ideas. Um, and frankly, I think that, in, you know, America, both left and right would benefit from more grassroots candidates like that. And the way to get that is, you know, take big money out of politics and lobbyism and so forth, uh, which we seem sort of far away from, from doing. Um, if I would, if I were to look AFC in the eye and we were colleagues in Congress, I would tell her she's wrong about everything, but I am impressed with her, uh, her, her forward attitudes and her, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, her, <laughs> her go get it attitude, you know, her, we can do anything attitude. I think that's, you know, if, if there, if nothing else, you could credit her for being a, a zealot. Um, so, yeah, horrible ideas, but uh, interesting style. Well, you threw a challenge out to her. Uh, we have it where Ilian Omar is not taking care of her her district. Uh, we had, um, who was the other one that uh, Trump recently called it? Was that Clyburn or was it, uh, no, it was the other one that uh, in the Baltimore district, not taking care of their district. Uh, but you put yeah, a challenge yeah, out there. You you said if you were elected to Congress, you would do something, and you want her to mimic you. Yes, that's right. So um, I have I have taken a pledge. The pledge is the first of its kind. I created it. Um, well, actually, you know, maybe Trump created it. But um, I, I'm going to donate twenty percent of my congressional salary back to worthy causes inside my district in in North Carolina seven. So whether it's you know, pro-family, pro-Second Amendment, anti-immigration causes. Uh, that's where 20% of my congressional salary will go. And I will honor that 100% when I'm elected. And I would challenge the socialists who believes that every, everybody should have everything for free uh, to do the same, who believes that 
uh, individuals and corporations are greedy. Uh, I would challenge her to, to not be greedy herself uh, and to do the same. I've also challenged our, my, my incumbent opponent, David Rouser, to, to do it, to give back to the people that live here. Because, again, it goes back to the, the whole community talk that we just had. Right? You know, what's, what's the point of having a representative republic if the representatives don't actually represent the people in their districts? And you know, one of the ways that elected officials can represent the people that they were elected to represent is to help them out financially if they can, which they certainly can because they make enough money. Um, so I'm not – look, I'm not <laughs> – I'm not running to get rich. Uh, you know, I make plenty of money doing what I do now, and um, now I'm running because I'm genuinely interested in in promoting populist ideas and helping ordinary Americans. Um, so that's really what the pledge is all about. Well, people can find you at Pete for F O R N C Pete for N C dot com. And as I said before, there's a link up on the show page, so that those that are listening they can click on it and go to it. If they're in the archives, listening in the archives, they can still click on it and help your campaign. Good luck, Pete, and we'll have you back again. You know that. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on, Annie, and, and uh, I, I hope to talk to you guys again soon. All right. God bless for the hard yeah, work you do. Care. Take care. Thanks. Pete DeBrasco. All right. Take check, care. Check him out, Pete4NC.com. Uh, Curtis, I've got to call out to our next guest and bring her on, Marianne Mendoza. So while we do that, we're going to take a little bit of a break as I play my commercial. And we'll be right back in a few minutes. All right. When an emergency strikes, what's your first impulse? If your answer is, run to the grocery store, you're likely to find chaos and plenty of empty shelves. So how do you avoid this? Well, it's simple. You use today to make a plan, to prepare for things that may happen. It's a hurricane, earthquake, blizzard, or even social unrest, especially in today's political environment. The practical place to start is by storing up food in your home. And I use my Patriot Supply for my food storage. If you don't have an emergency food supply, it's time to do so. Here's a great item that makes it really simple. A two-week food kit that comes in a rugged tote. And it's only $75 when you go to my special website, preparewithsouthernsense.com, or call 888-441-7290. This food kit includes breakfast, lunch, and dinners that will last up to 25 years on your storage shelves. So order now and prepare yourself, and then rest easy. So it's very simple. Just call 888-441-7290 or go to preparewithsouthernsense.com. You know what? Let's make it even more simple than that. You're listening to my show, and it's called Southern Sense, and you know you put a dash in the middle, southern-sense.com, and click on the icon for My Patriot Food. All right, and we're back, and I got an answering machine, so hopefully she will call back into the show. Uh, So, oh, well, can't always have it all work out. That was a good thing. Yes, yes. That guy was very knowledgeable, very impressed. Yes, and if they check out his websites, you know, he's got some great books out there, and I swear the book on AOC is really, really informative. So, yeah. Anyway, waiting for Marianne to call in, and I'm just looking for some articles here to talk about because i got a ton of stuff here, but I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. Uh, I'm real organized, aren't I? Anyway, um, oh, I have up the wrong thing, too. Well, what, is, what do you think of Trump going out to California? I mean... Uh, our side has been calling for him to go to places, even though they may be dominated by, you know, the left. 
he still needs to make a presence there. Well, he's going to be jumping into a lot of races, a lot of races. I mean, right now we've got five people primarying for the district I'm in here. Um, I understand. I think one of them may have dropped out, but someone else is also jumping back in. Uh, once these primaries are over, uh, I can see him getting into the fight and just trying to turn over blue districts into red districts, uh, especially if he goes into areas uh, that are purple, that he's got a good chance of helping to turn the seats over on. So, you know, I, I'd like to see that happen. You know, um, I, I'm just, I, I think he's going to do I, I think it's, a I big think change. It's good overall. I think it's good overall because um, we should never give up on uh, um, an area just because we don't, you know, dominate that area. I mean, you got to start somewhere. So, I mean, think about it. Uh, California used to be red especially under Reagan, and somehow the Democrats, <laughs> they changed it to purple and then to, to blue. So I think it could be reversed. I, I think so, too. And I think it could start with this president. Well, the big problem we're going to be having is by being banned on social networks. Getting our message out is going to be a huge problem because, as I said, you, you already have Congress trying to pass legislation that wants to revoke the uh, nonprofit standing of certain organizations, such as the Family Research Center, you know, places that are listed on the Southern Poverty Law Center as hate groups, which are just either Christian or conservative groups or pro-gun or pro-life groups. They're not hate groups. But they're going to try to find ways in which to keep our message out. The same way they tried to silence the Tea Party, you know, years ago. They're going to find any and every way to do it. And if they can use the tax purse to do it, they will. Now, here in South Carolina, they're trying to pass a law called a gag law. And it's a bipartisan law. And they're basically saying if you're a nonprofit group, uh, going before a primary, you cannot put out a candidate's name or where they stand on an issue. Now, here you may have a candidate that is pro-choice running against a candidate that's pro-life, and you're a pro-life group. You're going to want to get behind that pro-life candidate. No, no, no. In South Carolina, they're trying to pass the law that you will be gagged. You cannot put out positions. You cannot put out the candidate's name going into a primary. What happened to freedom of speech? Well, Well, that's what we have to, um, I think we have to get across, even if we have to go to court, like the, the leftists used to, you know, to, to press the case that you know, we do have constitutional rights and we need to defend those rights. You know, we sit down and just roll over every time, you know, the left incrementally, you know, take away or strip us of certain rights. Then we, we are doomed. So I say, you know, let's use the same techniques they have used in the past, and that's to go to to the courts. And and unfortunately, Trump is seating the courts with quite a few um, conservative um, judges. So that should help us in, in future rulings. Um, I don't know what it will do, but. Uh... We got to do something because again they're going to try to to gag us. And I wish we did have Marianne Mendoza with us because uh, I, that's exactly what I wanted to talk about. You know the gag order that's that's been not the gag order, but the manner in which Twitter and Facebook have been treating her by banning her. Now I just found out today that on Reddit I've been banned in two areas on Reddit. And everyone that listens to the show knows I'm highly pro-veteran. I'm highly pro-Christian. I don't put out things where I threaten people or I intimidate people, unless it's you know someone standing in front of me. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I found out that when I posted something up on Reddit and said, oh, no, you have been banned from the Christianity section and the veterans section. Can you believe that? Here, little old tiny little me. <laughs> and I find I've joined the crowd of being banned. So, you know, hey, it's a red badge of courage, and I'm wearing a red shirt today. So what what say to you? <laughs> hey, I say let's do what we can to uh, defeat these guys on the left and um, 
and win as many states and as many um, battles as we can in 2020, you know. Uh, there's a lot to fight about, and uh, I, I'm up to the task myself. We just have to get our, you know, fellow patriots in, in uh, a warrior mindset because, unbelievably, there are still some out there who don't really think there's no big issue, you know. I mean, they look at the two parties as you would two clubs, you know. They don't see any... Um, differences in their ideology or anything, you know, it's just the, the, the Republicans and you got your Democrats and oh, they all for themselves, you know, and if that's the way it's been, it's always be that way and, you know, the country will never become a communist country because it just won't happen because it never happened. I don't think they realize how serious the threat is. I mean, when you look at the squad, that's scary, those four. Oh, yeah. Not to wake up um, yeah. a, a polar bear, you know, hibernating. Well, but, you know, uh, we were mentioning the. We, we, got, we, got, I, we, we were mentioning the social networks, Twitter and Facebook, and there are other you know, social networks out there. There are there's most of them are startups. You got some of them such as Gab, Hub, MeWe, um, One Way, um, Pro America, uh, USA Life, uh, Parler. Uh, political speech. These are all, you know, startups. They don't have the the width and breadth that you have with such as Twitter and Facebook. And Twitter and Facebook know Amazon. it. They know it, and they use it as a bludgeon over your head. You either conform or be sent into exile to these other sites. You know, Hub is doing a good job in trying you know, to build it. Uh, some of these other sites are, you know, like I said. Me, we, one way. They're doing the best they can. But all you're doing in many of these places are simply preaching to the choir. The idea is to to evoke dialogue, to exchange thoughts, to make someone think. Say, hey, wait a minute, maybe this other person does have a better idea. Let's talk about it. But they're not allowing us to do that. How dare you, you know, say that, you know, that fetus in the womb is a human life. How dare you? I mean, some of the threats that they hold over you are in so much as having a father arrested. Now, hang on a second. Let me see if I can find that article. Because uh, a father is actually... You know, here it is for the message I got from Reddit. You have been banned from participating in uh, r backslash Christian you can still view and subscribe to r backslash Christian, but you won't be able to post or comment. They don't tell me what the post was. And then they repeat it for the veterans. So, you know, that's, that's the message I got this morning. Um, and, and see, that's why, that's why I say we have to put more conservatives in, in power in Congress so we can, you know, go after these companies um, legislatively and um, change their their policies and and have hearings on on Amazon, and Google, and Twitter and things like that. You know, um, these these high tech companies who are just about controlling every aspect of our lives behind the scenes because that's that's the way they work behind the scenes. You know, you really don't you're not up to you know speed on what's going on in the world. You think there's nothing that's going on in the world. And a lot of this stuff, like I said, takes place behind the scenes. But those in the know know what's going down. And that's why I think we need to um, regain the House, increase our, our numbers in the Senate, hold on to the White House. Lord knows what we're going to do after Trump leaves a second term. But I think that's why we have to make the most of this opportunity um, that we have with Trump in office for potential eight years. We need to restructure everything that that the um, the left has taken taken apart, you know. That's my thoughts on that. Well, if anyone's tuning in looking for Marianne Mendoza, she is right now MIA. I sent a message over to her agent uh, to see. You know, we may end up having to reschedule her. Um, I know that she was on the road doing a uh, Build the Wall uh, tour. 
And last I saw, she was either in Texas or New Mexico. Uh, she was posting up on Facebook yesterday and earlier today. But we'll find out what happened. It, it could be just a glitch that she may not be in an area where she can call out also. Um, but I was mentioning this father that is facing jail time because of a posting on a social media. And this is from Big League Politics uh, by Shane Trejo. Uh, he wrote this just a couple of days ago. Jonathan Vanderhagen, 35, faces charges of malicious use of a telecommunications device after exposing a judge on social media who took away his son, placed the child in his mother's care, which ultimately resulted in the child's untimely death. The trial officially began last Friday. Today's trial is the limitless money, power, and privilege of the Crown versus Jonathan Vanderhagen and the First Amendment. Your thoughts and prayers, please. Vanderhagen's lawyer, Nicholas Somberg, wrote on a Facebook post before the trial started. Prosecutors are arguing that Vanderhagen's First Amendment rights are effectively null and void because the family court judge, Rachel Rancilio, felt intimidated by his posts exposing her record. Assistant Prosecutor Elizabeth Rittendinger is using the fire in a crowded theater trope to justify the constitutional infringement in court. I think all this behavior, especially in its totality and some of its specifics, like the shovel posting, on their own create this violation of the law. Rittendinger, however you pronounce her name, you can speak freely, say all you want against the system, but when it comes to this level, you've crossed over into yelling fire in the theater, and that's not appropriate. It's a violation of the law. All right, despite the fact that it was clear that Van der Hagen's posts were referring to him digging up dirt about Rensilio's record, Rittenger argued the context didn't matter. A robed lawyer felt threatened, so Van der Hagen must pay for his illegal free speech. So he's saying, this is the judge's record, folks. This is who you're going to be standing before. This is how this judge has ruled. This is the dirt on the judge. So that alone is a threat. By exposing your public record, your rulings, that is a threat. And this is what they're doing to people. And, you know, God forbid it's someone like Melissa Milano who's crying. I know she, this, she's not an actress. She's not faking these tears. Nah. Crying about the children being separated on the border. What about this father that got separated permanently from his child? He told the court the mother is dangerous. The child will be in extreme danger if you bring this, give the child back to the mother. She is a danger to herself, to the public, to the child. And yet this judge returned the child and what happened? The child died. So in protest, to, pr to protect other children, he says, I'm going to dig up the dirt on this judge. I want to expose what her rulings were and what has happened to those families that she has ruled against. And that is then becomes hate speech. This is what they're doing to us. Illegal free speech. And WTF, Holger, is completely, exactly correct. You with me, Curtis? Did I lose Curtis? Am I, can anyone hear me out there? Did I get lost? Okay, folks, can you hear me? Annie? Yeah, I'm here. I'm back. I dropped out. Oh, you dropped out. Okay. I dropped out. I heard, I heard a dead spot there. All right. All right. But I was talking about this father who had the child removed, and he told the judge that it, the woman's a danger. The mother is a danger to the child. The child's going to get hurt. It's going to get harmed. And the end result is the child was killed by the mother because of the mother's lack of care. And when he protested against the judge and said, hey, listen, how many other children have been harmed? How many other families have been harmed? Let me dig up the dirt. And it's been called hate speech, and he faces jail time. The father faces jail time? The father faces jail time. He lost his son, and he may now lose, lose his freedom. That is terrible. Yeah. Yep. It's a travesty. Exactly. Um, and, and this happens a lot. You, you get judges 
who are sympathetic to not the victim or potential victim, but the the perp, and they end up like in the criminal case, end up releasing somebody um, that has a, a, a history or track record of um, being disruptive, um, going against you know what we call lawful, and um, they some of them are violent, but. You got some of these folks who are um, of the mindset that we can redeem these people, you know, rehabilitate them. If only we give them another chance. So that's the plot. And then they let these guys go, or women, and they, but more so men, and then they kill somebody like a month later. Or, so what, what, what can you say, you know what I mean? Well, you know... This is exactly what's happening. Now, um, Peter had mentioned Mecklenburg County down in Maryland, and there's a group down there called Casa de Maryland. And they were they were founded, a nonprofit, and they also get government money, uh, donations also. Uh, they were fund, founded so that they can help illegal aliens working here in the United States not be deported. And they go through the court cases, whatever, to help them retain their job and re- remain here and get a visa to become a legal resident. That's th- that's the purpose of it. But in the end, they ended up helping nine illegal immigrants charged with rape. Um, this is from the uh, Epo Times. Since July 25th, the county has been rocked by rape allegations for which nine illegal aliens have been arrested and charged. Victims include 11, 12, and 15-year-old girls. And it has been now, I found another article for the same area, a child as young as six, Curtis, a six-year-old child that was attacked not once by this illegal alien, but multiple occasions. Uh, At least five of those arrested had been previously deported, were slated for deportation, or released from jail without being handed over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which had placed a hold on them, according to ABC 7 reports. Um, Democrat County Executive Mark Elric uh, spoke at a pro-sanctuary counter-protest, basically embracing the mantle of the sanctuary anarchist. On July 22nd, Elrich signed an executive order that prohibits county officials from asking anyone their immigration status or to assist an immigration investigation without a court order. It also closes non-public areas of the county jail to ICE agents. Elrich has since said that he might amend portions of the executive order but released no specifics. In one of the recent rape cases, Rodrigo Castro Monteo, an illegal alien from El Salvador, was charged and released from jail on bond. According to ABC 7, one ICE agent was notified several hours before he was released. However, the agent was on vacation, and Montgomery County jail officials failed to follow procedure and notify the 24 hour line. Wow. Wow. Unbelievable. In Montgomery yeah. County, police reports have, from 2009 through 2014, the number held steady between 102 to 129 rapes per year. In 2015, the number jumped to 278, mainly due to reporting changes to align with the new FBI definition, as well as adding child rapes to the number, previously counted under child abuse. Since then, the number has increased to 309 in 2016, 2017, 398, and last year, catch this, Curtis, 509. Holy cow. Wow. This is in a sanctuary county. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Sanctuary for the criminal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Unbelievable. And you're going to have your friend Ernie right. calling in shortly, correct? Right. 
And I think that's the thing we should we should press every chance we get, especially Trump. You know, these sanctuary cities are nothing but sanctuaries for the the criminal the criminal mind or criminal elements. Now, I, I it's think... not for the safety of the people. As a matter of fact, a lot of these people starting to um, raise their voices against these sanctuary cities. And I'm talking about people that live within these sanctuary cities. Well, I, I see someone in the studio. I don't know, Curtis, if that is your friend that's in the studio, if you can take a look at the number. And uh, if it is, you know, feel free to bring them on. It's uh, it's crazy out there. And, and people seem to feel these sanctuary cities, there's no harm in them. No, they're just coming here to have a, a job. When you see the crime rate jump from 102 rapes to over 500 in just a small span of years, and children as young as six years old, uh, there's something wrong. There has to be a mental illness. In this. It's either that or something's in the water. I don't know which it is. It's evil. Evil. <laughs> All right. Um if that is okay, it is your friend. All right, let's bring yeah, you can bring. let's bring on our next guest, Ernie Ricard. Good afternoon, Ernie. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. I was I was just hey. listening in on y'all. I didn't know if you knew I was on the line yet. Oh, oh yeah, Curtis. technology. <laughs> okay, Curtis was asleep at the wheel, so I had to pride him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome aboard, uh, Ernie. And you had message, messaged me that you wanted to come on the show because there was something that you wanted to discuss and talk about. So feel free to start the conversation because Curtis sent me everything kind of a little bit late. So I'm a little behind here. Okay. He was here early at the shop this morning to to get that stuff. So uh, he he was Johnny on the spot. I'll have to take up for him. The... Um, <laughs> One one little thing I'd I'd like to make a little statement. Uh, Lord, please empower my pen and voice with your spirit that it will bless and build up, never tear down. May it give all the desire to speak and seek truth and refresh their soul. Open hearts so that they may see rightly. Love is the universal language and may it travel far and wide today through Ann's program. That's just, I appreciate the opportunity that you give me and everything. And Curtis and I talked about, you know, 9-11 and how it was at the first of this month or September. And um, I'd like to read you a, a, a poem that a friend of mine wrote and then I'll discuss uh, a special 9-11 commemorative challenge coin. It's a firefighter challenge coin that I designed. And this is uh, Edwin Corwin, and it's called In God We Trust. <clears throat> we watch the evil fanatics strike their blow, unable to believe their cowardly show. Thousands of people went to their grave in the land of the free and home of the brave. Our society was rattled, our emotions torn, forever changed on that September morn. We watched as those heroes rushed in to save, then they joined the thousands sent to their grave. When the buildings came down in rubble and dust, our nation was united, in God we trust. A war had begun for freedom once more. Some people will die as they had to before. The battle is long and we've only begun, but we will prevail. We won't cut and run. We will rid the world of this terrorless blight. Our mission is just. Our cause is right. Our enemies are ruthless, cunning and defiant, but now they have wakened a mighty giant. We will defeat them whether near or afar, and those that would help them, all enemies are. Most of the world stands beside our great nation. America must lead, because that's our station. It must not be our goal to get even the score, but we will not rest till they are no more. 
when the battle is over and finally done, when evil ones are vanquished and the war is won, the mighty giant must never sleep forevermore a vigil keep. We have turned to God in our time of need, and in him we must trust and in his words we must heed. May God grant that goodness will have a new birth and that his peace will be granted to all men on earth. And the um, 9-11 commemorative challenge coin that I designed, is Curtis carries one. And I, I'd like, if there's a sponsor out there that would like to sponsor me to go to New York to give all the fallen firefighters families one of these coins. I'm going to try to describe it to you. It's an inch and a half bronze coin. It's divided down the center and then it has two little quarter pie shapes. On one side it has the symbol for fire. On the other side it has the symbol for life. A firefighter's job is saving life and property. It has a seven-link golden chain that holds the ribbon at the top and the ribbon at the bottom, and at seven is Alpha and Omega. And the ribbon at the top reads, When at War, Soldiers for Fire Combat. The ribbon at the bottom reads, When at Peace, Firefighters. And what I described to you, it shows the peace sign on the front of the coin. You turn it over, it's the World Trade Center stairwell. It has two firefighters. It, one is fighting the fire. One is on the radio trying to get everyone out. They know at that point they wasn't going to make it. But the one that's on the radio, he's reaching up in the fire and smoke, and from the edge of the coin, you see the arm of an angel reaching to receive him. When a brother can't get to you, there's a special angel that comes with this coin. And all you have to do is reach up, and he'll help you make the transition. Then if you look in the stairwell, you see a link has been broken and represents a loss of life. And that's the manner in which one will receive it. And you read the ribbon at the top. It says, no greater gift, a life for another. And then when one answers the last alarm, that coin that, he accepts and agrees to carry it on his person, is placed over his heart, peace sign up. Then as a brother addresses his place of rest, puts one in the manner in which he first received it, broken link side up. It's a very powerful uh, coin in everything. has a lot of meaning. I'd like to see firefighters everywhere uh, get one. And now, Ernie, yeah, Ernie, you, you're a former firefighter. Um, what were your thoughts when you, or are your thoughts when you, you see video of those firefighters lining up to go into the two towers on 9/11, and they, they, some of them don't even know they may not even come out alive again. What, what are your thoughts when you see scenes like that? That's a the training that we go through and everything. That building should have never come down. It had to have some help that they uh, uncovered some of the protective coating on the steel reinforcement inside the building or, or something. But I don't think you can name any other high-rise building in the United States or the world that has come down due to fire. So maybe I'm opening up a can of worms again, but they should have been able to get up there and fight fire, even though it was heavy. And, and the get building, out alive. That's, that's right. Well, the Ernie, building should Ernie, not have come down. Ernie, I happened to have been on duty in ni February 93 when the Trade Center was attacked the first time. Uh, my precinct I was in was right across the bridge from the World Trade Center. And after that investigation <clears throat> that came out, they said at that point the only way it would come down is if you had a, a heavy fire on top 
to force everything pressurized down. They couldn't take it from the bottom up because that's the way the, the building was designed. They never thought that the two planes would be crashed into it. Uh, so the reports that came out said that would be the only way. And what, what did Bin Laden do? He sent his engineers over here to study in our colleges, to learn how to fly our planes, because he knew what was in that report. Yeah, that, that's true. But still, those buildings are engineered. You know, they'll literally gut themselves out in everything before before they come down. There, there was something else. I be, This is my personal opinion, and, you know for what that's worth but uh i i still don't think the the building should have come down and and i i'm with you on that because in philadelphia there was a major fire right across from city hall downtown center city and it burned for 14 hours and you know they they put the fire out eventually and renovated the building that building still is in use today well, look at the Empire State Building when the plane crashed into it. You know, it burned out. You know, they put it out. But um, they're they're engineered to uh, take so much of a fire load. Of course, a plane with full tanks and things like that. But I, I think some of the uh, statistics that they'll tell you that it got hotter than any uh, 1500 degrees or whatever. Yeah, because you had full so. load of full load of fuel, and if you're talking about the Empire State Building, that plane crashed. You're talking about a much tinier plane that crashed into it compared to you know a, a jet airliner. The, the capacity of the airliner for fuel, weight, thrust, you know, coming in at full speed compared to a tiny prop plane that hit the Empire State Building. You're talking about a Tonka toy compared to a semi-truck. That's a huge difference. Well, the, the thing is, the, the building codes were much uh, more stringent on the uh, World Trade Center and everything that were on the Empire State Building. I mean, yeah, the, these new high-rises and everything, they're, they're designed to, to take fire if, if they do without coming down. Well, so that was also another problem with the World Trade anyway. Center because NYPD did not have the capacity to get all the way up to the top floors. You know, the equipment simply didn't do it. They were relying on aviation to douse any fires from above. But even that is a limited capacity if you have a fire inside the building. Again, it's a, a design flaw. Well, they they uh, have sprinklers and standpipes and things like that. Uh, you know, that'll go off before the fire department even gets there. So, uh, you know, but when you have a jet fuel fire, it, it's it's something else. And, I, I, you know, I'm not the only one that felt that way. If If those officers would have thought that building would have come down, they would have told everybody to evacuate the building. Well, so, again, again, having experience in NYPD, I know what the tactics were. I know where they were going to be placing the equipment. Having been at the World Trade Center several times, you know, well, the, 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 the only way know, they would the have been able to handle it is by being directly in that plaza, to triage people directly in that plaza. But also I knew what the what the original reports had said. I didn't read the the reports. All I know is, as we were discussing it within the police department, they said, well, they didn't get it by going underneath. If they do, they're going to get it from going from above. Yeah. Well, if you if if you knew that fire department, they have probably uh, pre-planned the World Trade Center as well as other high-rises around there many, many times. Fought it on the blackboard put where they're going to, you know, what they're going to do, where they're going to stage everything. And uh, when the when the buildings come down, it was like a predetermined demolition. 
you know, they, they each plane hit on one side, but those planes come, I mean, that those buildings come straight down. And why do you think Bin Laden sent his people over here to study engineering and flight? <laughs> he, 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 he knew I, what we I knew. I don't want to give him credit for a good job, but, uh, you know. Uh, he, he knew what we knew. And he used it against us quite effectively. Matter of fact, radical Islam is still using what we do against us. You know, we're still under attack since 9-11, even well before that, uh, because... You're right. Recently, um, this was... CARE was doing this. Uh, it was... Look, maybe, oh, Michigan. A church in Michigan, the Bloomfield Hills Baptist Church got care so angry that they had announced to have a 9-11 memorial event with Shadram Haddon, a former Muslim who's planned to deliver a speech titled How the Interfaith Movement is Sabotaging America and the Church. And they got it shut down. So this Christian church could not have a 9-11 memorial because of care. We're still under attack in our society, and everywhere else. Well, I, I can give you an example of, uh, you know, the, the Tea Party has been great. It has kind of fought for us for things and everything. And I was at a meeting one time, and they they said, well, we're we're going to do away with prayer and the allegiance and things like that. I said, you got to be kidding. I I said, why? He says, well, we're we're going to give you a moment of silence, so we won't offend anyone. You know, we got to stop worrying about offending anyone. This is America, and if you're America, you have to stand up. You know, and every time you reach your hand in your pocket, you know. You touch in God we trust, and our forefathers, at when they were working on the Constitution and everything, they said we are one nation under God. I don't know of another country or nation that has made that claim. And so, if we want to call ourselves an American, then they put that title on us many years ago when they designed the Constitution. Do you know what the Statue of Liberty is holding in her left hand? Uh, the Ten Commandments. Nope. I'm, I'm trying to picture it. Now, why am I... Statue of Liberty. Why am I stupid? The Statue of Liberty, she holds the torch in her right hand. Mm -hmm. And she holds, you know, as a light or an example to the rest of the world that America's got something special. In her left hand, she holds a keystone. The keystone is the stone that the builders rejected in building God's temple and had to go back amongst the rubble to retrieve it. And on that stone is chiseled, you know, the old saying, it's written in stone. Well, is July 4th, 1776. You know, that's our independence and where our Constitution come from. And the keystone is the highest stone in the arch and gives it its strength. You can't move it in any way. If you do, it, the arch will fall and crumble. And that's the message our forefathers, I believe, was trying to get to us. You do not change the Constitution. It's just like the Word. <clears throat> it's the same today as it was yesterday and should be tomorrow. And so, well, they're trying, but anyway... Yeah, they're trying to change us left and right, that's for sure. Yeah, so I, I wrote this, and I'll, I'll read it to you, and it's called Silence. Father God, thank you for prayer. I praise your holy name. And what is asking your name, I know will be done. Our land is in trouble. We need a renewing of our minds. Our hearts has deceived us into covetousness, lust, and material things of this world. Many no longer praise your name, and others speak evil as good. Father, we repent. 
Give our nation a new heart, that our words are your words, your ways our ways, your law our law. September 11th, we called your name and was united once again. A mighty sleeping giant arose. United we stood. Once again, we have fallen asleep, and our enemies, foreign and domestic, are rising up against us. History has taught us we can never sleep. America is special. Her motto, in God we trust, must remain at all costs. Our constitutional benchmarks have been moved. We ask our leaders to take America back, in God we trust. And place your name above all things. America is nothing without your love and protection. Please, Lord, don't take it away. Have mercy upon America. You are our God. And your banner will forever fly in our land. No longer will we remain silent. I am so ashamed of what America has become in the name of freedom. To remove your name in exchange for a moment of silence. Lord, This is not the freedom I choose. This kind of freedom we all lose. America will fall. Our leaders should bear your name and be governed by your laws. God, I ask your spirit to descend upon these listeners. May truth and brotherly love prevail. Lord, walk with America. Lead us out of this valley of death. And that's what I wrote to the Tea Party. Well, you know, it's it's sad that you had a Tea Party group that would not have a prayer and a pledge of allegiance. Now, Curtis has been to my group. And he he knows how I started. Every single one starts with a prayer and with a pledge of allegiance, and we stand there with our hand over the heart before the flag. You know, if you have a Tea well, Party group a- that that does that, they're not a true Tea Party group. Uh, even though we, <laughs> we we are not. Well, we the, did up to that point, and after I opened my mouth. You know, then then I got the job uh, to say a little prayer. Well, you know, you as, know that I, as you know, the Tea Party group is not united under one banner. There is no one leader for all these different groups, <clears throat> if they still exist anymore. That's true. And in our county, at one point, we had three. We're down to one, mine. And I, we've been here now 10 years, and we still, every month, <clears throat> hold our meetings. Um, if they are out there, they've got to stand for our founding principles. And you cannot bend yeah. to social correctness. Because if you if you make that compromise, then everything is lost. We have to stand by the Constitution, by the Judeo-Christian values of, of, of our society, of what we were founded upon. You can't call yourself... Exactly. A Tea Party group. That's that's why this Liberty's holding that keystone in her left hand. You know, uh, you're absolutely right. And you know, we we can't we're we're getting pushed around and pushed back by political correctness. You know, we're they don't have the freedom to do that to us. You know, there there's some things you just don't do. You know, and when you call your freedom is able to take an original freedom of our founding fathers away. And that's what's happening. Sharia law, you know, that's like oil and water. Uh, it, it doesn't mix. It, it, so, does, it does not. It does not. And if if we are to reclaim founding father's ideal of this nation, a nation, one, united under God, where we're all treated equally in the eyes of the law, we must maintain those founding principles. But we're allowing society, for whatever reason, you say, oh, you you, you can't say prayer in public because you might trigger someone. You can't carry a Bible to school because it's religion and government being mixed. Um, You can't preach in public because you might offend someone. Heaven forbid you say Merry Christmas or God bless. You know, you're going to trigger someone. You need those safe spaces. You have to have that. People are so delicate that you, 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 how 
dare you exercise your First Amendment right of freedom of speech and freedom of religion? How dare you? Because you're going to trigger me. Well, I think we've got a man in office that's trying to bring some of that stuff back. And I, I don't know if Curtis told you the, the story, but about eight weeks before the election in 2016, I was here late, like I'm now uh, in the office, <clears throat> and the the Bible just happened to appear. And so little voice just kind of spoke to me, said, open it up. I opened it up, and it said, at the last trump, and then the trumpets will sound. I said, Lord, we got a man by the name of Trump running for the highest office in our land. I said, is, was he chosen to lead America and perhaps the world from the, the evil that's trying to take it over? I said, if that's true, would you send me a sign? And I said, was he prophesied all those many years ago? And so I went home and uh, 7 o'clock the next morning, Saturday, a man pulled up in front of the shop here and he come in. He said, Ernie, I got some used parts I want to sell you. I said, I'm not interested. He said, well, just come out and look. And so I finally went out there just... And when he opened the back of his vehicle, he had two huge trumps, big boat air horns. Chills went up and down my spine, and I told him, I said, I'll take them. When I got back in, I had a conversation. I said, Lord, I don't think he stands a snowball chance in the hell of winning. All the polls are saying, you know, just contrary. But if you're telling me, He's going to be the next president of the United States. I said, I'll blow these things for everything they're worth when he takes the oath of office. So Monday morning when the guys come in, I I shared my experience with them. And I said, I want you all to build a bracket to go on top of the golf cart so we can mount these horns. And I went and bought an air compressor and everything. And and, uh, so... That was about eight weeks before the election. And the guys, they kind of looked at me because the polls wasn't very uh, flattering as far as him winning. And so, but we were there after election night and he won and everything. Uh, man, it, it was something else to celebrate around here. And then when he took the oath of office, I drove that golf cart out. And when I let it rip, I think the leaves on the trees across the street fluttered. So, but I, I just, and to, that kind of leads up to this other little thing I wrote about god's answer you know we ask god to send us a leader and president trump he's been leading (laughs) and he's done a lot of things and it's hard to pull the wagon by yourself but anyway i wrote this it's god's answer to america america asked god to save our nation god sent a builder with the heart of a lion and eyes of an eagle but with a slightly tilted halo. Like the stone that was rejected in order to complete the temple, this man too is rejected to make America great again. This stone Liberty holds in her left hand, the keystone, gives the arch its strength as our Constitution protects freedom and keeps America strong. Our Constitution is America's benchmark. It should never, ever be changed or moved. President Trump's heart is true. His love for God, family, country is strong. His goal to make America great again is backed by faith, that America will unite one nation under God again. With his pen and tariffs, not bombs and bullets, putting America first, fair trade deals, factories and jobs are returning, America is respected again. President Trump 
is God's answer to America. The world can't buy him, but they have to deal with him. Good for America, good for the world. He is the last trump before the trumpet sounds. Oh, I'm willing to bet your neighbors loved you when you went blaring those uh, air horns. <laughs> I'm sure they had a lot of fun <laughs> well, with that. We're sort of, yeah, and we, the the guys just every now and then used to, if the tanks were, the air tanks were up, they'd go over there and toot them. Because, you know, it, it was so negative, the election and everything, and the, all the things that was coming out was, you know, he didn't have a chance. But I tell you, one plus God is always a majority. Well, you know, there's several. And if we there's several different things you said, especially in in that poem, that you know, um, God always chooses a sinner to do His work. You know, there was only one that was sinless, actually, one that was sinless, which was Christ. Then again, you can also say the Virgin Mary. Um, but he he chooses the sinner, Moses, David, yeah. Abraham. See, that that's Gabriel. You know, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But since Jesus paid the price for us, and through His blood, you know, and the mercy and grace covenant that we're under now, you know, uh, and all these things that they're going back and trying to accuse people of doing when maybe they were younger or something, but, you know, if if you're a Christian, you can repent. You know, they, they asked President Trump, you know, well, don't you repent? And his answer says, I don't do it no more. And... <laughs> That that's the way we should be, because we have the ruling guide, you know. And if we done the one thing, the golden rule: do unto others, you'd have them do unto you. You know, th- this would be a much better world. Yeah, and instead so. we have it. We must do what the social justice warriors dictate us to do. You know, they must have their safe spaces and safe zones and segregation, so that they do not get triggered. But heaven forbid, what well. they're doing ends up triggering us. No, no, no. We can't react. We're not allowed to. We must accept what the social justice warriors want us to accept so as the new norm. Stop right there, Ann. Stop right there. No, you you put on the armor of God and take the word, and that's the way you fight it. You We don't have to do anything that they want us to do, you know. And if it, if it offends them because we try to do what's right, so be it. And mm-hmm. we, we just, and, you know, and one of the... Uh, conferences or something President Trump slipped and he said the GD word you know I don't like to hear that but that's just cussing do you know what it is to take God's name in vain go ahead okay when when you take God and you ask him in it it's like when you took your husband's name, and if you don't do according to the vows that you stood before God and man, then you took his name in vain. Uh, saying the GD word is merely cussing. But now, if America, we have took God's name. You know, we are one nation under God, and that's the way it was set up. That's why we come here, you know, in everything. And if we don't act accordingly, now I'm not saying that you need to be pushed around by political correctness because love is a strong thing. If you love your country, you're willing to give up your life for it if you're a true American. And we have a lot of people that have done that. And, uh, 
you know, at the World Trade Center, our soldiers and everything. We've got memorials all around. And uh, but it it's people like you and your program and Curtis getting the the word out because they have brainwashed people into thinking that they have a right to say some of the terrible things they have to say and stomp on our flag and you know I'm going to stand up for it and if if I stand up then that's going to give someone else the courage to stand up and if you stand up you know then someone around you is going to get that same courage we we can't be pushed around and put down by political correctness a, a christian is meek do you know the definition of meek well it doesn't mean that you're going to take power under i was going to say it doesn't the, mean you can be lying down taking it that's for sure no meekness i'll give you an example and it's a beautiful example the Clydesdale horses, mm-hmm. when they are pulling that wagon and they're all in step, it is a beautiful thing. It is power under control. But you know who holds the control? The guy with the reins. And that's the same thing that our forefathers intended for us to do. You know, we have the reins to our life, we can make it wonderful. Or we can make it pure hell on earth if we let people push us away from what our founding fathers intended us to do. And, you know, it's not bad to to believe in one true and living God. And I've, I've got so many things that are ready to get out. And maybe Curtis will help me with a with a book. I've got enough to do a book and uh, but I appreciate this opportunity and uh, you know I, I wrote another thing because uh, I was concerned uh, about you know the justice system and oh, yeah. so I'd done a little research and everything and I developed and built a special gavel and, you know, if you want to get the best wood, you know where you find it? Go ahead. In the heart. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, the gavel head was fashioned from the heart of red cedar. The point of beginning for all is their heart. The heart is a symbol of love and life. Love being the key and only path to life eternal. The heart is where true beauty lies. And the gavel handle was cut from white oak. White is a symbol of purity and truth. Oak for its hardened grain and symbol of strength. A true gavel is 12 inches in length, as the number 12 includes the sacred numbers 3, 5, and 7. The head measures 3 inches by 5 inches. Three inches for the diameter and five inches in the length for fellowship. The handle measures nine inches added to the diameter of the head equals the number 12. A symbol, the number of hours in the day or night that the officers should be ready to serve and govern the people. The number seven is not marked because it is... The beginning and the end, the begin again. It is Alpha and Omega. And when the sound of the gavel must be heard to enforce the sacred laws for the government of the people, it must be done with love and strength, whether to call from labor to refreshment or refreshment to labor again, or pay wages, if any be due. The gavel is a very powerful tool. Used properly, it will promote truth, justice and harmony it will build character for a better world and spread brotherly love to all who abide within its sound the gavel a powerful weapon or tool 
and we're seeing it used both ways now. So, well, justice can be a two-edged sword, that's for sure. And uh, <laughs> that's it. That's <laughs> it. And she's not so blind anymore. No. You know, I think she's got earplugs that they're they're trying to dictate, you know, an uh, outcome. Yeah. Would would you like to hear? Uh, uh, I I wrote and designed a poster for Vietnam soldier. You know, President Trump has declared a Vietnam holiday in March, and I think this March will be the first time that uh, it'll be uh, observed. This this poster. Uh, has the POW MIE flag, okay. and an eagle is in front of it. And the uh, POW MIE flag come out with white specks in it. I started to send it back to make it politically correct. God spoke to my spirit. He said, these men are home. And when you look at it, it looks just like the heavens. And the eagle has the wings spread, and under those wings all this transpired. And the right talon is filled with errors. That's the things that was said and done that hurt the soldier upon his return. Nowhere in the world has a soldier been treated the way the Vietnam soldier was treated. He was spit on, called all kind of names. And they even told him, son, you might not want to wear that uniform. And I know he probably told him, I was willing to die for this uniform. But the left of the eagle holds the olive branch, the healing, when we finally say, welcome home. And thanks to President Trump now that they will be officially recognized. And the American flag is draped in the background. It borders this poster in red on the sides. That represents the price that some has paid for our freedom that's in danger today. And it goes like this. Daddy did and Grandpa carried the red, white, and blue. They carried and defended it in Korea in World War II. Freedom restored, they came marching tall, back to the home of the brave and freedom for all. The first to greet them was Lady Liberty. Welcome back, soldier, who fought to keep our land free. I carried old glory, so proud for my country and to them, like a good soldier. I follow the orders of my command, not knowing I was caught in a place between hope and lies. Shame filled my heart when back home I was despised. Even old glory bled into the fields of white, and she never seemed to fly as free that night. I could see a circle of shame surround her stars. I asked, can I ever go back? Have we gone too far? Brothers and sisters, my heart was noble and pure. Now it hangs heavy, my goal. Now I'm not sure. I was betrayed. I want to come home. I suffer defeat. Remember, I was caught between my duty and deceit. All home had was abuse. And people spit in my face. America, I was willing to die. What is happening to our race? Many of my companions turned into misfits drugs and crime. No helping hand was found. They said the fault was all mine. The lucky ones were the ones that came home in a sack. But the ones with the scars of battle are the ones that lack. I die a little more each day. The agony, guilt, and pain. I was caught between duty and deceit. Is my cry in vain? Have I paid enough? How much longer must I pay? What will it take, America? Just to hear you say, Welcome back, soldier. Fountain Ham. We understand, soldier. We now blame Uncle Sam. It is long overdue. And for all you Vietnam, welcome home. Well, just so the listeners know that the National Vietnam uh, War Veterans Day was actually proclaimed proclaimed, not enacted into law, on March 29th of 2012 by President Barack Obama. 
it was the Vietnam Veterans Day Coalition of States Council that presented a letter to President-elect, President-elect Donald Trump uh, and congressional leadership asking him to make it enacted into law, which he did on March 28th of uh, 2017. Uh, that was the first official recognition act. Uh, so Trump did sign it into law, even though we have to really honestly give the original idea to Barack Obama, give credit where credit is due. I mean, <laughs> I don't like the man, but I will be honest and say that he did He did proclaim the day. So it would be March 29th okay. of 2019 is where you will have you're going to have some sort of a celebration or something like that, recognition, parade or something for the veterans in your area? Are you talking to me? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be. Uh, I've, I've been guest speaker at the Traveling Wall twice, and I, I give these posters out to the uh, veterans. And... Uh, so I'd, I'd like to get one to the uh, the wall in Washington. So I, I have so much stuff that needs to get out in people for people to enjoy, and uh, I uh, <clears throat> I I kind of wrote another little thing, and I, I titled it "War." you know, to help people understand. And uh, it starts off, Will wars ever end? One stops and others begin. Has war ever been right? What makes a man fight? Wars among nations, clan against clan. Wars within nations, man against man. Wars within the heart, joy and strife. Wars within the family, husband and wife. Leaders make promises. People have hope. More law is their answer. What a joke. Love is the only way to win. All must change from within. Love your neighbor is where to begin. The wages is peace. Then war will end. Love is always there to lend a hand. All must mount that rock and stand. Only with a heart Can you see through the dark? Love is the only way we can meet our mark. Love, love, love let it be. It is the only answer for you or me. Well, we wish we could get a little that love being spread from the uh, left over to our side here, you know, because we are under constant attack. You know, recently we had uh, this Texas Democrat representative, Joaquin Castro, his brother's running for the presidency. He loves us so mm-hmm. much that he exposed donors to the Trump campaign, which is in violation of the law. Oh, yeah. So anything they can do to silence us, to put us down, they will use warlike tactics, whether it's exposing donors and and breaking the law. And once the donors are exposed, their names, their addresses, their employments, you think they're going to be safe at home or at work? No. They're going to do whatever (laughs) it takes to stop us. So we can use as much love as possible, but we also then have to use the full extent of the law to go back after them. Thankfully, we do have, um, let's see, uh, Republicans have actually... Uh, con- conservative lawyer Dan Backer filed an FEC complaint uh, saying that he violated the Federal Election Campaign Act. So we can love as much as we want, but hey, listen, when you turn the other cheek, it doesn't mean feel free to let the guy slit your throat. You know, you have the right to well, defend do you know, your life and your faith. Do you understand turning the other cheek? Oh, absolutely. Let me explain it. Okay, well, I don't think you do. When you turn the other cheek, they used to slap you with the back of the hand. Yes. And most people were right-handed. But then you turn around, and what that does, that puts you in a defensive position. Exactly. You don't have to take, you don't have to take the other slap. Precisely. And, you know, and you do that out of love for the, 
your your country, your family, your God, or whatever. You know, that's the kind of love I'm talking about. A good, strong love don't mean you're weak and be able to push around. That love makes you strong, and you will even give up your life to defend it. Exactly. And we are in a and, battle. We are in a battle for the moral values and the soul of America and of, of our faith. And we're, we're being fought on every single uh, front that we possibly have. I mentioned this earlier in the, uh, in the show that House Democrats in the Ways and Means Committee <coughs> excuse me, um, said that over 60 alleged hate groups, mostly Southern conservative organizations, anti-immigrant entities, and religious groups should be stripped of their tax-exempt status. The very same thing they did to us as Tea Parties, they're now trying to do to these other groups by the House and Ways Means Committee. And some of these are the American Family well, Association. If you, uh, We've got the Security if you Policy your Council. Church, we've your got, God and everything, stand well, up for it. Well, you know, you, you don't let them push you around and say, well, I thought you was, you know, uh, a loving Christian. Well, a loving Christian has a right to stand up for what's right. Which, and, which is why you know, I'm getting the word we, out we on this one. We have a ruling guide. That's why I'm getting the word out huh? on this, so that people can stand up. They can get a hold of their congressman and say, hey, tell the House Ways Means Committee to leave these groups alone because the Southern Poverty Law Center d- determined them a hate group. Wait a minute, the FBI determined the Southern Poverty Law Center a hate group. So you're going to follow a hate group's recommendation to censor conservative and Christian groups, pro-life groups, pro-Second Amendment groups, pro-free speech groups, because the Southern Poverty Law Center deemed them a hate group. So that's why I'm getting the word out, so people can stand up and they can fight back. Well, you know, a, a lot of that, you know the, you know what the original school book was, don't you, for America? Go ahead. The first original school books that they used was the Bible. And they they kicked that out. And ever since, you know, they, they started doing that, and then government started telling you how to raise your kids, you know, about... Uh, then the Bible says you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And that's exactly what's happened. We have kids that don't respect their teachers, and they don't even respect their parents because the parents are afraid to lay a hand on them because they'll be reported to, you know, some agency or something, and they'll, you know, we got to stand up. I mean, if you love your child, then... You know, you're going to put a reminder on them when they do something wrong. Because if you let it go and let it go, uh, we, we're, we're seeing what's happened. You know, when, when I was in school and everything, we, we hunted sometimes before school. and Sometimes we'd get together after school. And we had rifles and shotguns in the back windows and things like that. Never once did I think about uh, shooting somebody with it, you know, because we went hunting with daddy and uncles and grandparents and everything, and we were always taught. And then sometimes when we go out on someone else's land, whether it was hunting or fishing, we we see fences that need to be mended or or something like that. You know, we'd, we'd just put that on hold and help. And in the fire service, uh, when we would buy a home and then our family would increase, we'd all get together and put on a new room or if you needed a roof or something, all come over and, and you know, get together and help one another. You know, united we stand, but we're, we're all getting away from, you know, helping and we shouldn't do that. Again, this is something we discussed earlier in the show, the lack of community, the lack of family, the lack of a father in the family, the two-parent household. You know, you used to have your community centered around the church. No longer. We have become a disposable community. 
we're not even a community anymore. It's a disposable society. You go out to a restaurant to eat and everyone's buried in their smart device and no one's talking to each other. How many times do people now sit down to dinner together? At least once a week? Very, very few families, if they do that at all. You know, you go in, you throw something in the microwave, you plop down in front of the TV or your computer or your smart device. And there's no interaction. They have dehumanized us. You know, with the TV shows, the kids are smarter than the parents. The parents don't know anything. So the kids are the ones that have to run the family. Yeah. You know, children, pre-born well, children are no mistake. longer human. You're, you're They're a parent. Things. You're not just a friend. The, um, now, I, I didn't know we were going to get into this, but I wrote this way before there was ever any shooting in a school. My uh, daughter, I've got twin daughters, and one of them is a school teacher. And she was thinking about, you know, putting teaching aside for a while and maybe start a family. And uh, <clears throat> so... I wrote this uh, with, I, I could just see it, and it's called, I Will Change the Times. All right, we're down to our last nine minutes. Uh, I hope it won't take too long. No, it won't take too okay, long. Okay, greater. It, it's a it, little bit, I'll, okay. Once upon a time, a young school teacher said, good morning, boys and girls, and the class would say, Good morning, teacher. And the teacher would respond, Let us start our day with honor to our God, flag, and country. The teacher loved the children, and the children loved their teacher. The teacher looked, took leave to start her family. As her children approached school age, she thought it would be nice to pick up where she left off. She was so excited and a little worried, but so happy to be back with the children and the job she loved so much. First day of school, bell rang, time to start. She noticed the different hairstyles, tattoos, and relaxed dress codes, but she thought, these are still just children. A little nervous, she said, good morning, boys and girls. Shut up, bitch. Pass the condoms or we'll blow your blinking head off. And the class laughed, and the law plainly states, children have rights. The teacher thought, so little time, so much change, is it too late? Oh God, where have you gone? Never ever did I think the job of a school teacher would become the most hazardous job in America, the one nation under God, or is it? Well, I'll just leave it there with y'all. <laughs> thanks thanks a lot, Ernie. Thank you for joining us. And good luck on the Challenge Coin, uh, your posters, and the gavel. Uh, people can find you up on Facebook. So if they're looking at the show description, there's a link to your Facebook page if they want to contact you and find out more about the Challenge Coin. Uh, I wish you a lot of luck. Well, My suggestion is maybe contact your uh, congressman, and maybe he can do something with the wall and maybe with the Challenge Coin, too. Okay. I, or maybe there's a listener out there that would like to sponsor it to go to New York to give all those fallen firefighters' families one of these special coins. Well, good luck. Whatever. And God bless in the hard work you do. Thank you, Annie. Take care, Annie. I, I thank you. It, sure. It's nice. And thanks, you, Curtis. Annie. Okay. All right. All right. Good night. Good night. All right. Uh, that's basically just about all oh, we had God for God. the uh, for the day. I'm sorry, uh, Maria, uh, Marianne Mendoza didn't join us. Um, I had gotten a message from her agent wanting to know what happened. So I'll just talk to him later on, see if we can get her rebooked. Like I said, she is doing a build the wall tour uh, right now through the Southwest. Uh, so maybe she was in an area where she couldn't call, but we'll find out. You know, it happens. It's live radio. want to thank everyone that joined us on the show. Tim has, I think Tim may have a show coming up. Tim Tapp is in the chat room, Tap into Truth. Check him out. Uh, thanks, everyone, that was participating in the po conversation up on Facebook. Thank you over there also. Uh, my high school buddy that used to carry my books for me is over there on Facebook. Mikey, uh, true story. <laughs> True story. Anyway, um, that's all I've got for now, Curtis. Uh, do you have anything to add? 
and just have a safe weekend and uh, get ready for 2020. It's going to be a, a fight. <laughs> it's going to be a rocky fight. It's going to be, but I think I think we can be very pleasantly surprised. The same way everyone was surprised Trump won. I have faith. When you see the crowds out there, you see the invigoration of people. I mean, our last GOP meeting, the room was packed. People are getting involved because they see change happening under President Trump. I'm invigorated. I'm happy about it. And I hope you are, too. So uh, that's basically all I got for now. Uh, So with that said, I will leave you all with our closing song, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. And I say until next Friday, good night and God bless. Ninety seconds.